All right. Uh, good evening, all and sundry. Um, we'll now call the March 10th meeting of Complete Streets Commission to order. This is a teleconference meeting with Complete Streets Commission members, city staff, and members of the public participating remotely to ensure proper social distancing in this federal, state, and local emergency. Uh, moving on to the roll call, where I would like to introduce Complete Sheets Commission members and staff present. I'm Chair Adina Levin. Commissioners present include Katie Baruzzi, Jackie Stebrian, Patrice Espinosa, Bill Kirsch, Lydia Lee, and Mike Meyer. Uh, John Cromie is absent. Staff present include Kevin Shen and Patrick Palmer. Uh, so now, uh, Patrick, will you please provide instructions to the Complete Streets Commission and members of the public on how the meeting will proceed from here? Yes, thank you, Chair Levin and members of the Complete Streets Commission. Uh, welcome everyone to the March 10th Complete Streets Commission meeting and thank you for attending. At this time, we ask that the members of the commission please remain on screen for the duration of the meeting. You will control your own webcams and microphones. Staff will engage webcams and microphones to make presentations and respond to the members of the commission. For members of the public who are in attendance and wish to provide public comment, after the chair calls for public comment on the item you wish to speak on, please engage the raised hand feature. I will then have the ability to open your microphone and you can provide your public comment to the Complete Streets Commission. Uh, that concludes the instructions and I return the meeting to the chair. All right, uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, moving on to reports and announcements where under reports and announcements, staff and commission members may communicate general information of interest regarding matters within the jurisdiction of the commission. No commission discussion or action can occur on any of the presented items. Um, are there any reports and announcements? Thank you, Madam Chair. I do have a few announcements. <clears throat> you can just bear with me for a second. Uh, just wanted to update the commission on a few actions that the city council have taken since the last time we met. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the Santa Cruz Avenue street closure, uh, the city council had decided to extend that, plus the temporary outdoor using permit program all the way through uh, end of January, 2022. So um, there'll be, uh, for, for those that are, um, uh, you know, frequenting the outdoor dining, uh, definitely good news there. Uh, and for just to um, remind the commissioners, uh, this would be, the south side of Santa Cruz between Evelyn and Crane, uh, what we call the 800 block, and then also Curtis to Doyle, which we call the uh, 600 block. There's also a, uh, a discussion that had taken place by the city council on their 2021 priorities and work plans. Uh, a lot has been discussed, uh, but in terms of transportation, there were a few items that, that came to surface. Um, mostly regarding um, some of the, the projects that, that most of you are interested in. So the first and foremost is the coupling of the Middle Avenue traffic calming project with the Middle Avenue crossing projects. Right? So there's a desire to kind of look at the whole thing holistically as that they're connected um, by, by each other. There's also the desire to, to see if we, have, we can couple the Willow Road traffic calming project uh, with the resurfacing project that is uh, coming up in the near future. So this is uh, a resurfacing project on Willow Road from Middlefield and Bay Road. And, and as coincidentally, there have been some requests to put in traffic calming measures. So one of the, uh, the desire from the city council is to see if there's a way to couple those projects together, um, not unsimilar to the Ravenswood project that we'll be talking later on tonight. Um, lastly, there's a, <clears throat> there was a strong desire to, to evaluate the uh, quiet zone for, for the crossings uh, within the city boundaries. So those are, those are uh, highlights of the transportation projects. Obviously, what that means is that staff will have to go back and, and sort of evaluate some of these you know, comments and feedbacks that we have received. And then we'll be returning back to the city council with a, a more clear agenda uh, of what that means uh, in order to incorporate this, uh, some of these projects into the priority list. Uh, so with that, I will conclude my reporting announcements. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I have a clarifying question. So um, will staff be bringing back to council um, any report where if any of these additions have any impacts on other items that were already in priorities or already in the CIP? 
yeah, that definitely. I think that will be one of the elements that we have to evaluate, um, as it does have an impact to to resources and and not just staff resources, obviously, but the, the financial resources um, implications. So all, all of that would be evaluated. Yes. Great. And when would those be expected to be brought back to council, including any trade offs that may occur? Uh, I believe we're aiming for um, either. March, end of March, so it would be the March 23rd meeting or maybe April. Um, I don't have a clear day yet. Once I have that information, I'll, I'll be sure to share that with the commission. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions or items to add under this agenda title? Okay, I am not seeing any hands raised. So we'll move on to the next um, and uh, let's see if there's any members of the public with any hands raised. I am not seeing any. Um, so we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is public comment, where uh, under public comment, the public may address the Complete Streets Commission on any subject not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the commission once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. Please clearly state your name and address or political jurisdiction in which you live, the commission cannot act on items not listed on the agenda, and therefore the commission cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. Um, Patrick, is there any public comment at this time? Currently, it doesn't look like it. Um, I'd just like to repeat for any members of the public who might've joined us. Uh, if you do have a public comment, just use the raise hand feature and I will be able to allow you to speak. Okay. Um, so thank this you. time it doesn't look like it. Mm -hmm. All right, so we will then uh, move on in the agenda to regular business where under regular business, the commission considers recommendations from city staff on policy matters or administrative actions that require commission approval. The first thing that we will do is to approve Complete Streets Commission regular meeting minutes of February 10th, 2021. Um, is there any feedback from commissioners on the minutes? Let's see if I can see more people at once. I do not see anybody with any hands. All right, do we have any public comment on the minutes? Not seeing any public comment on the minutes. Um, uh, is there a motion and a second to approve the minutes? Is that a motion from Commissioner Kirsch? Right. I'll second. And second, Baruzzi. Um, so uh, can uh, uh, staff take roll call for this motion? Great, thank you. Um, so if I can have a, a raise of hands for those that would like to approve the I do see unanimous voting. So great, thank you very much. All right, thanks to all. Um, so for the next item on the agenda, we will receive an update from the City County Association of Governments of San Mateo County on the San Mateo County Community-Based Transportation Plan. And Kevin Chen, Senior Transportation Engineer, will introduce this item. Um, and then uh, staff from CCAG and their consultant PlaceWorks will present. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, again, Ch Kevin Chan, Trans Senior Transportation Engineer with the City of Menlo Park. Uh, well, we're happy to, uh, to be joined tonight by, by uh, Susie Kogan, uh, Transportation System Coordinator at CCAG uh, and also the, their consulting team, Greg G G uh, Goodfellow, Senior Associate at PlaceWorks. Um, so they're here to introduce the, their regional plan tonight. Um, as many of you know, um, the, the CCAC, the county in general, has quite a bit of work going on regionally. A lot of pet and bike plans that I had introduced to the group before. And this is another effort um, that the, the CCAC is working on in hope of closing some of the regional gaps. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass the baton to uh, Susie and have her introduce the, and present the item. Thank you. Thank you very much, and um, thank you for having us here tonight. Um, I, I just wanted to just give a brief overview. Um, about two years ago, 
CCAG was awarded a grant from um, the MTC to update community-based transportation plans throughout the county. And these are plans that are focused on the needs in defined areas known as communities of concern. And as the name implies, um, it's really intended that community members are the, uh, at the forefront of engagement in identifying the transportation gaps in these areas and helping to develop the solutions. Um, so to help us along with this project, we've uh, retained PlaceWorks. Um, and then tonight we have with us Greg Goodfellow, who's the project manager from PlaceWorks uh, working uh, on, on this plan, as well as an update in Daly City. Uh, so that with that, I'm just gonna turn this over to Greg uh, to walk you through where we are. So thank you again. And thank you very much, commissioners and Susie. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, Kevin, can you advance the slide one more? All right, I really just have two simple goals this evening. The first is to introduce the Southeast San Mateo County Community-Based Transportation Plan, which I'll refer to as the CBTP. As Susie said, we're also working on an update in Daly City. Um, PlaceWorks recently did a series of updates in East Contra Costa and West Contra Costa County as well. Uh, and my second goal is to maybe hear some input from you to increase community participation and stakeholder involvement in the plan, which is a key element of all uh, CBTPs. Next slide. Okay, I'm going to go over some of the fundamentals of uh, CBTPs just for to get you uh, up to date on what they are. I think many of you are familiar with them. Um, going back to the beginning, CBTPs are basically a response to a white paper put out by MTC about 20 years ago, the main finding of which was if we're really going to improve mobility and fill in mobility gaps in the most underserved communities, we can only do so with some very direct and very diverse outreach to those communities themselves. And the idea is to improve mobility uh, for what MTC and others uh, technically call communities of concern. I'll get into that a little bit more in the coming slides. And MTC has some very uh, basic requirements for all CBTPs. As I said, they have to be the results of a very inclusive planning process. They need to improve a range of transportation choices. These are multimodal documents. And they need to address mobility gaps identified through direct outreach to low-income communities. Next slide. Thank you, Kevin. All right, so what are these communities of concern? Well, they're basically uh, the result of tracked level algorithms using census data. And uh, they're based on eight different variables, minority levels, low income levels, levels of English proficiency, or I should say non-English proficiency, uh, levels of the elderly, zero vehicle households, single parent households, the disabled, and then rent burden households. So what are COCs? Well, they're either one, census tracts that exceed both the low income and minority threshold levels, or they are tracts that exceed low income threshold and three, and a combination of three of the other thresholds. Go ahead. All right, so how does this play out in Southeast San Mateo County? Well, there are 12 census tracts considered communities of concern in the area and they cross jurisdictional boundaries, as you can see in that purple hashed area, which are the communities of concern. They're East Palo Alto, Menlo Park, Redwood City, North Fair Oaks, as well as unincorporated areas of the county. Uh, they comprise about 70,000 residents, um, 20,000 households, uh, made up of about 13,000 families. Uh, what's interesting about these COCs that doesn't happen in every group of COCs, all 12 of them are low income and all 12 are rent burdened households, which gives you an idea of sort of the demographic challenges in the area. Something else that's interesting, especially uh, certainly as compared to our daily city CBTP, is that these are 12 contiguous tracks, as you can see, spanning these different jurisdictions. Whereas in daily city, there are five discontiguous tracks, but all within the same jurisdiction. So these two CBTPs present this very different uh, set of challenges based in terms of both recommendations and an outreach. Next slide. Okay, so let's get, let's get into outreach a little bit more. Um, 
MTC does have a very uh, strict and solid set of requirements for outreach. Uh, first of all, all CBTPs need the support of a, a selected advisory board from the very beginning. Ours is a great board uh, set up of various jurisdiction staff throughout the jurisdictions, representatives from SAMTRANS, uh, representatives from nonprofits and uh, NGOs, for example, commute.org. Those are just a, a few of them. All MT, excuse me, all CBTPs should be the result of stakeholder involvement. This is where you really get on the ground support. Let's work with CBOs and nonprofits who understand their constituents in these areas. And the idea is we're not getting direct feedback from these stakeholders. We're getting their feedback in terms of who to reach, where we can reach them, and then also working with them to use their email list, use their networks to reach these people. So that's really the role of these stakeholders. And then, of course, getting right down to the ground is our diverse community engagement plan. MTC is very clear that these things can't be the, based on a single outreach mechanism. You know, one flyer put out there, no matter how um, diverse or, excuse me, how spread around it is, it can't just be one group of workshops. It's got to be a group of these different strategies to get quantitative and qualitative information. Next slide. All right, now we get the impacts of COVID in this process, which of course throws somewhat of a wrench in this MTC system of outreach. Uh, the first issue is that now we need to get into these very creative outreach approaches. Obviously, we need to keep ourselves distant, maximize these virtual tools we have, but then you get into this conundrum. These low-income communities are the very communities that we need to think about in terms of the digital divide. They're the ones that we can't just assume uh, we'll have access to virtual tools, we'll understand virtual tools, we'll have broadband in their homes. So while we can't rely on traditional face-to-face -face outreach, we also can't rely, excuse me, <clears throat> on this digital outreach that we've all come to rely on so well. Um, the other issue is that what we hear from these communities is going to be different because of the shifted mobility landscape. A year ago, what we may have heard from uh, members of COCs is not what we're going to hear now. They're not using the same buses, buses. They're not traveling to work. Their children are not riding bikes in the same disconnected class one bike lanes to get to school because they're not going to school. So we need to think about the relevance of what we hear now in terms of what is ultimately a, a document with a 10 year planning horizon. And then finally, the CBOs that we want to work with, their priorities have shifted you know, they may be not focused so much on technical or mobility issues. They're focused more on economic support, making sure their constituents are surviving. They're focused on health, lifestyle support, obviously. So as we perform this outreach, we're facing these new challenges and we're needing to think about the resources and the priorities of our stakeholders. Next slide. All right, so our current outreach efforts now, um, First thing we've done is we have connected with a lot of CBOs and what we put together is what we call a stakeholder survey for them. Again, this is not to collect the direct feedback we'll use to create recommendations. These are broader uh, perspectives we're asking for. You know, these are not multiple choice questions the way a typical survey is set up. These are open-ended questions asking these um, CBO representatives, you know, what are some problems that you know about with your constituents? Are there issues of um, areas that are difficult to reach that people need to get to? Are, they, are there medical center, centers that you know your young families can't get to very well? Are there food deserts in the area um, that are impacted by mobility? Things like that. And then we've also put together a more direct community survey. These are what we will use for our quantitative information. And we've done them in dual languages. We'll also do a Tagalog survey. Um, these are more multiple choice, what you would think of as a traditional survey, but they do have open-ended elements of each question. And they also include COVID related questions. What we're trying to find out of course is what are the persistent challenges? What were you facing before COVID? And what do you think you'll be facing even afterwards versus what are the issues that are very COVID related that you think um, are not gonna be as relevant once life goes back to quote normal or quote new normal. So we're trying to tease out these issues of COVID versus not COVID related challenges. 
And then of course we have questions about what would improve these issues. You know, if it's difficult to get to this um, medical center or this job center, what bus, what bus route would um, help with that? Or, you know, what disconnected class four bike lane needs to be connected, these kind of things. And then finally, we've put together um, materials for our stakeholders. Um, we're working on a compensation package with CCAG, knowing that everybody's resources are stretched thin. And then we have what's called a level of support document where we're giving uh, stakeholders the chance to look at how they could help us. It may just be hosting our link, our, uh, <clears throat> our survey links up on their social media, or it could be all the way to uh, helping us get staff onto workshops that we put together through their networks and actually host through their networks, more intensive support such as that. Next slide. All right, our next steps obviously is gonna be to keep our survey distribution going, um, getting it out to stakeholders, government and local leadership, social media, um, sharing it with social support centers, senior centers, job centers, et cetera. Uh, we'll uh, solidify our stakeholder and our CBO contracts. And then finally, after the outreach is finished is when we'll start putting together our recommendations and our planning and our policies. That's where the advisory body comes back together. They'll review everything we do, help us prioritize those recommendations. And, you know, as MTC requires, and as I reminded you earlier, recommendations in CBTPs have to be diverse and multimodal. They can be everything from very programmatic recommendations. Uh, you know, uh, the cities of such and such should work towards developing grants and planning for vision zero plans, or they can be very targeted um, traffic calming on this street that is plagued by, you know, off highway traffic uh, avoiders, or, you know, extending a key bus route to get to a social security office so senior citizens have an easier chance to get there. So again, very multimodal, very broad from programmatic to um, actual uh, physical improvements. Next slide. All right, that was really my, the, the, the base of my overview. What I wanna hear from you, if you have questions, of course, please let me know. But I would also love to hear if you have any ideas for perhaps CBOs we could keep working with that you think would be able to help us or ideas for places we could post our survey links just to get them out there better. Events that you maybe know about that you'd think, hey, this would be a great place to get information out or in a very distant, safe manner, you know, have some hard copies of your survey, anything like that, that you think could help us with our outreach to these underserved communities. Um, Kevin, it might be nice if you go back to that slide with a map on it, so everybody could kind of get their head around where, we, where it is we're talking. Thank you. Great, thank you, Susie and, uh, and Greg. Uh, so at this point, I guess I just open the, the floor up uh, to the commissioners for any clarifying questions, and then we can go to um, the, the public for, for public comment periods. Um, so again, this is a fairly high level uh, conversation that we're having right now. The, as far as the, the CBTP is concerned, it's, it's a very beginning stage. So they're looking for really um, broad comments, uh, gaps, et cetera. So, Anything that we can uh, provide, um, I think, will be very helpful in this situation as as the uh, CCAC plan continues to plan this um, develop this plan. Um, Adina, I think you're muted. Um, okay. Um, I am glad that the fellow commissioners and staff and consultants did not hear me chewing dinner. Um, uh, are there any commissioners um, in addition to me who will have questions and comments? I will have comments, but I don't have questions right now. And I see one public commenter, so I'm gonna hold off. Okay, um, so, so I, I have a few questions. Um, anybody else have questions? And then we'll uh, take uh, the uh, public comment. Um, <clears throat> the, um, do you have, um, like out of 
the um actually i'm going to start someplace else this is not the first community-based transportation plan um do you have any information about uh what the recommendations were from the previous plan and what has been implemented from the previous plan yes very good question first of all i'll start with the fact that and this is one of the most telling um realities of underrepresentation and challenges in the bay area in 2005 again this is an update to an existing plan the last plan was in 2005 and it was it was also based on communities of concern but at that time the only community of concern in the entire area was in east palo alto so that 2005 plan was the east palo alto cbtp what's happened in 15 years is that census tracts that display these you know track level challenges have obviously broadened all the way up to redwood city so, you know, okay. the answer to you know, your first I, I, I apologize, I'm going to interrupt you because we have a member of the public who needs to leave momentarily and is a city council member. Okay. So we'd like to call on council member Taylor um, while uh, she is able to speak. A uh, council member, uh, 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 Taylor. Hello. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. Um, okay. Cecilia, go go speak. Go speak. Cecilia's about to speak. So I I, I appreciate it. I, I have a another another meeting. Um, I I am I am on CCAG um, for the council. Um, but something I, I just dawned on me. I, I really appreciate your slides. I did not have a chance to look to see if there are the attachment and the agenda. So that was my first simple question. Um, are the are the slides that you just shown, the ones that we're looking at right now, are they in the um, the agenda as an attachment? I can take that one. Uh, yes, Council Member Taylor, the presentation is currently attached to the agenda. Okay. Um, and then my 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 second question is that just thinking outside of the box, the the one piece that may take you a step further to getting public input is taking the word minority off all of your documents. Mm -hmm. Just a, a suggestion. Um, and then the other is that doing community outreach during a COVID is going to be challenging. So the list that you had, um, none of that's open at the moment. The list of? The list of places where you were, you're going to get um, feedback. Right, the libraries aren't open. Um, places that you know people commune are not necessarily open. Yeah, no, we're, we are aware of that. Um, it, it is. It's certainly a challenge. So, you know, it's got to be a combination of. I mean, ideally, what I would love to happen is to use the CBOs we work with, use their um, their networks to host virtual meetings, and also, of course, our survey and. You know, our, when we wrote this, the proposal for this plan before COVID, you know, what the, the most wonderful feedback we get, certainly in, in past CBT PES, is what we call pop-up events, where we actually go to, you know, the very um, type of support events that these communities go to on their own, where they trust, you know, the environment and actually bring maps, bring documents, bring sticker activities to show, oh, this is a problem intersection, this is a difficult bus route, do face-to-face -face interviews. And you're right, we can't do that so much now. So this is also why I came to this meeting tonight was to hopefully hear some ideas for alternatives to those traditional face-to-face -face outreach tactics. But you're absolutely right. It's, it is going to be difficult to penetrate these communities with outreach in COVID, during COVID. Which groups are you already working with? Uh, I don't have my list in front of me. Front of me. I'm sorry. Um, that would be really helpful in terms of um, enabling us to make additional suggestions to the ones that you already have. Okay. I mean, does anything come to your head immediately or come to mind immediately for, for youth or seniors, I should say? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I want to hear from Council Member Taylor um, anything else that that she 
uh, has to ask or say while she is uh, uh, available with us. Uh, at no, that was all. And thank you, Chair, for recognizing me. I, I really appreciate it. All right. Uh, th th thank you very much. And, and hopefully the team will reach out um, to, uh, to, to Council Member Taylor, um, who will have uh, additional suggestions to the ones that uh, we will uh, come up with. Um, I will have some more questions, um, but I, I'll, I'll hold off my more questions until other commissioners have gone. Um, I see that Commissioner Baruzzi has a hand um, with some questions. Um, oh, are these questions or comments? We're, we're still on questions. Oh, okay. All right, sorry. Okay, no, I'm no. not. I'm not out of questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, I actually have a question. Um, it, are you using? Um, so this is about outreach specifically, um, yeah, but I want to assume that there's also some level of like observation happening. So I mean, one thing to understand, one thing to do is just you know to to watch, like to just observe what people do. And, um, you know, there's also like all the Twitter's data and stuff like that, but I'm assuming that you're all looking at that to get a sense um, just of like the lay of the land. Is that accurate? Or is that something that you're thinking about doing? Um, well, no, actually it's not, but I'd love to hear. I mean, do you mean, you know, observing entries and exits from bus routes or? Yeah, or I mean, I think it would be useful to and, and actually a lot of other communities are collecting this data at various points. Um, I mean, I was just looking at the healthy San Mateo County um, mm -hmm. data that showed that, you know, by, it was showing the percentage of people by census tract that were like active commuters, for example. Um, and I, you know, different cities have gotten, have been collecting data for things like transportation master plans. Um, you know, there's collision data that you can look at um, from uh, the, the Switters database. There's a really nice GI, uh, um, GIS mapping tool that Berkeley's put together that you probably know about. I feel like I'm even talking to a professional here. You probably know about this, but if you don't, I can share that with you. Um, but I, I think like, you know, it, it's, it, we don't wanna like, you really wanna get people's first hand experiences. And also you don't wanna necessarily overburden people at a time when they're feeling especially vulnerable. And mm -hmm. so insofar as there are ways to observe and, and look at existing data, that would probably be a good supplement. Yeah. Okay, well, in that, in that respect, then we do, we do have put together a very lengthy existing conditions and community needs assessment report, which does look at all types of data. So, I mean, yes, using yeah, you're right, many yeah. maps, many gra graphics, many tables, so. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, uh, Commissioner Brucey, do you have any more questions? No. Okay. Um, how does this uh, relate to the reimagined SAMTRANS, which is happening right now, which is the comprehensive operational analysis that SAMTRANS is doing to uh, redo their routes and they're doing community outreach in the same time frame to get information about their bus routes. So is this dovetailing um, are we asking the same people two different sets of questions or is it being combined? How is that working together? Well, there two, they are two different plans. And I mean, the idea for this one is that, I mean, Reimagine Sam Trans has a specific topic. This has a specific target population and many topics as far as mobility is concerned. You know, everything from bike planning and school safety to as I said, program level, you know, transit improvements. So it, there will be overlap. And, uh, but again, this really has to do with that purple hash line of a community of concern and, um, and reaching them. It, if know, I might they, add also, yeah, we do have Sam Trans sits on our steering committee and right. they did have input into the survey so that they would have questions kind of that would address you know, in, you know information that they're trying to collect as well so mm -hmm. um, yeah and okay. many times the recommendations in the cbtp will be a related to an existing plan that 
perhaps isn't, hasn't been adopted yet. For example, in our Pittsburgh Bay Point plan, a number of the recommendations were supporting um, plan policies in the Pittsburgh Active Transportation Plan. So they had um, you know, a, a proposed bike route on a certain roadway and we heard from many of the populations there that this is a very difficult you know, roadway to bike on and it leads to both the high school and the local community college. So our recommendation was, you know, for, for lack of a better word, yes, let's focus on policy 2.86 in the Pittsburgh Active Transportation Plan and bump that up because not only was it a finding in the ATP, but it was also a finding from populations we spoke to. So again, these things do dovetail with existing planning, but it could be most, it, what it generally is, is if, if there's an overlap in prioritization, let's make sure it's highlighted in our plan as well. Um, great, uh, two more questions for you and then we'll um, open for comments. Um, in terms of languages, really glad that you, you're doing uh, uh, Spanish and um, also wondering um, in Menlo Park, um, I know that we have a you know, Asian Pacific Islander population and I am wondering if either council member Taylor is still listening or uh, Jackie, who's a um, Belhaven resident, um, are there uh, language needs um, or other language needs that we have in Menlo Park in addition to you know the, the, the obvious Spanish? Well, we, we have brought on a, a Tagalog. So it, certainly in Daly City, there was no way we couldn't bring in Tagalog for the Filipino population. So it, we'll translate that or we'll bring that down as into the Southeast San Mateo plan as well. So that's a third language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I know that like in, 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 um, in, in East Palo Alto and Menlo Park, there are people who are Tongan and Samoan, um, but I don't really know about the English language proficiency. So if anybody else has any ideas, um, that is a question I had or, or any other langu language needs. Um, lastly, in terms of the timeline, what is the timeline of the survey? Well, we'll keep it going certainly through April. And um, I'll let Susie, if she wants to, talk a little bit about the timeline, because there is a discussion with MTC and CCAG right now about, you know, truly how we'll deal with COVID and if we should extend outreach or pause it right now. And, um, you know, we have heard from other from East Palo Alto and from others in these meetings such as this that, you know, there's some thought that maybe out, this isn't the time for full penetration in terms of outreach to these communities right now. Susie, do you want to add something or should we? Yeah, I don't know that there's that much to add to that, but we are, okay. um, you know, I think we want to see how we do with these surveys, um, but we are definitely not closing off. Um, if we don't get the kind of input that we need, we, we're not going to um, close off other options, you know, including delaying the project until things open up more. All right, that, that sounds really, really good because you know the president of the U.S. has announced that there's going to be enough vaccines to vaccinate the entire population by the end of May, and I don't know what that means in terms of how fast people will actually be vaccinated. But it, it does imply that not too many months from now, there will be more people that you'll be able to reach with a little bit more flexibility. So I suspect that you know a, a few more months of that timeline may enable you to reach more people. Um, uh, so um, with that, um, we would like to um, open, uh, are, okay, are there any, additional public comments from members of the public before we go to commissioner comments. Um, I see one hand up from council member Taylor, but that may be a continuation from the previous hand that was raised. Um, uh, council member Taylor, is that a current hand raise? If it is not, um, any other members of the public who have comments or questions? I'm not seeing any hands raised. Um, 
Uh, excuse me, Chair. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if Council Member Taylor was given the opportunity to, to speak, so maybe we'll give her a second. Oh, got it. <clears throat> so, Council Member Taylor, I don't know if you have any public comments you would like to, to speak at this moment. Okay. I'm going to take that silence as a no, so thank you very much. Sorry for the interruption. Okay, um, so as we move to commissioner comments, I'm gonna um, keep the window open for members of the public who may wish to ask questions or, or comments before this item is over, but we'll move to commissioner comments. Are there any commissioners that have comments? Uh, that, uh, all right, uh, Commissioner Lee. And I see Hi, Commissioner Lee. Yes. Hi. Hey, are we in the port part of the, um, the discussion where I can maybe offer some suggestions for outreach? I feel like um, I should probably defer to, to Jackie here. Is Jackie, is Jackie on? Um, she had said that she was going to need to step away um, between like 7.30 and 8. Um, uh, Kevin may remember the time or I can look it up. And um, so she may be back, but she may have stepped away right now. Got it. Well, um, Greg and Susie, you may have, you know, thought about all these, these options already. Um, but obviously in the Bellhaven neighborhood, there's the Boys and Girls Club, um, who, which I know is doing you know, a lot for the community, including um, meal distribution, pretty. And so if you had a, a, a printed survey, I imagine that it'd be pretty easy to include those in the meal boxes as they go out. Um, mm -hmm. That's happening very regularly. Um, there is the Facebook Farmer's Market which I think is still running right now. I haven't been there myself, but I hear about it from other people in the community that say it's a really great way to get groceries. And so again, you know, they, they put together boxes that people can pick up. And so it's a, a pretty much, you know, it's not like a, I think right now they've moved to a, a less, you know, people picking all the vegetables up separately to just, you know, you can get a special box and it's just, a, yeah. And so anytime you have a box, you know, stuffing a flyer in there might be, uh, obviously it's a little bit of a time consuming for whoever's doing the stuffing of the boxes, but if they're already stuffing them, adding one more thing might not be so sure. bad. Right? Sure. Um, so again, I would be looking at like, what are the, if you're trying to reach people right now, like, you know, those food services are really vital, right? So uh -huh. that strikes me as like the really, maybe the easiest way to get surveys into people's hands at, the, at this point. Um, I, I'm just trying to think like, how if I personally were trying to reach out to somebody there in that community and wanted to get feedback, there are, you know, like lots of special Facebook interest groups. For example, I'm a member of one called Buy Nothing. I don't know if you've heard of Buy Nothing, but it's, it's a great way, <laughs> right. So it's a great way to share, um, share stuff and no money is exchanged. And there's actually quite a few people in Bellhaven that are part of the Facebook, the Buy Nothing from in the park. So, um, I, there's a being neighborly equivalent to like, so buy nothing doesn't encourage like outside. It's all about stuff. So you can't just post random information there, but there's a, um, an a, a, a associated group called being neighborly, which is the kind of informational um, response to buy nothing <laughs> in, the, for right. the, in the park Facebook group. So the being neighborly group is where, you know, you could, uh, or, you know, I would, share a survey or something like that of community interest. So um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that comes to mind. Anyway, that those are the things that are off the top of my head. Thank you so much. Those are all good ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Berzi. Um, I had some more ideas along similar lines, um, you know, just sort of figuring out like where people are showing up right now. And you know, one thought that I mentioned with a little bit of hesitation because I, I could see like there being some like sort of ethical issues or concerns around this, but I'm just throwing it out there in the spirit of brainstorming. Um, you know, it's um, 
there are going to be um, vaccine clinics. I mean, there are vaccine, there's a vaccine clinic happening right now um, at Ravenswood Health Center. Um, and there, I believe will be an additional vaccine and testing clinic that's going to be opened at um, the Bellhaven Community Center area. And I think people will be waiting in line. And right. if people are waiting in line, uh, somebody could give them something to read or could ask a couple of observational questions potentially if it didn't feel too invasive and if you know appropriate social distance was being kept. Um, so again, it's sort of like kind of trying to be sensitive to people's comfort level with you know mm -hmm. having conversations uh, even if outdoors, but that strikes me as like you know we're gonna have people they're gonna be in line. That may be a place to go. And then the other thing is that the schools are actually about to, um, it sounds like the schools are gonna be re reopen. And um, one, one way perhaps to um, uh, connect with families in some of these communities is to work through the, um, the Sequoia Union School District um, where you know, students have been uh, using online systems to get to do some of their schooling already. Um, and in some cases probably have a little bit more English proficiency and, and families of limited English proficiency. And so it could be like, um, that could be sort of an intersection point if the schools are willing to um, potentially distribute surveys or yeah. it, it might no, be. And I've, no. I've already learned that's the case. I've reached out and we're working, for example, with Bayshore School District in Daly City and Jefferson Elementary School District in Daly City. And you're absolutely right. The school districts wanna help and um, we're, we're, you know, we're working with Safe Roots to School and um, that's a good. That's so a good Sequoia thing. Union scoops up a lot of the Southern San Mateo County students that you're, you know, in the neighborhoods that you're looking at. Great, thank you. All right, um, uh, any other comments from fellow commissioners? I've got a few other uh, groups for the list, um, there is um, a group called Bellhaven Action that's been um, working on, um, you know, a number of community programs, including the uh, testing uh, site, and um, uh, they have um, they may have venues, and they may they will have um, good insights on reaching um, people in Bellhaven. Um, there's a group called um, the Bellhaven Community Development Fund that gives um, grants to um, a variety of um, Bellhaven activities and groups and will be a good source of information about um, other uh, groups to reach people in Bellhaven. Um, there's a group that you may know of called uh, Yuka Youth United for Community Action that serves youth in uh, East Palo Alto. And they're also doing some work with youth in um, Belhaven these days. Um, uh, in addition to Sequoia, um, uh, Menlo Atherton, uh, you know, draws teens. Um, from the um, Bellhaven neighborhood. So, um, you know, um, uh, 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 MA. Um, uh, there's also a website that called Bellhaven News um, that you may have in your queue. That is a good way to reach people. Um, and um, there's also an active next door where if you if there 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 are people in your contact uh, list um, who are our residents are able to post for next door and also the city has the ability to post on next door, so that's another good way of reaching people. Um, also, um, uh, you know, churches are generally a good place to reach people. I don't absolutely yeah. Um, and like, I, um, I, I don't have a list of churches. Um, I uh, do. Oh, okay, good. I've looked at them. Okay, cool. 
but thank uh, you. All right, so that I, I've probably replicated the whole list that, or I, it's like some fraction of the list that you have, but no, really you've you've added to it. Trust me. Okay. Um, Um, also, in terms of posting things, there are a uh, number of local grocery stores that, like, I'm not sure what the uptake is on, on flyers at the grocery stores, but that's a common thing to do to place flyers at the uh, sure. local grocery stores, including the, um, you know, the, 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 the com community markets. Um, let's see, um, any other, um, uh, Commissioner Bruzy has a hand. <laughs> uh, Katie? Um, I feel like the improv person who keeps hogging the show. Um, so another thought is that I didn't address the known gaps, restrictions, or accessibility challenges. We've been thinking about this so much around here lately because of the working on the transportation master plan. Um, but one of the biggest things that I just wanted to flag for you in this area is that the multi-jurisdictional nature, the interwoven jurisdictions makes a lot of um, project management and funding and just sort of coordination really challenging. So just to give you one example, um, there's a, sort of a Bermuda Triangle of, um, you know, the, the approach to Menlo Atherton High School, which which draws a lot of kids from all over Menlo Park, but, and, and also East Palo Alto. Um, and also, uh, there are two different roads that people often take, Coleman Avenue and, uh, and uh, Ringwood. And each of those is, um, straddles three jurisdictions. Right. Um, and so uh, none of those has been very easy and neither has particularly great bike or pet infrastructure right now. And yet we have dozens, hundreds even of students commuting by bike and by foot on these roads on a regular basis. So from a safety perspective, um, from an accessibility perspective, um, like looking at some of those um, sort of multi-jurisdictional intersections, I think would be a really, really, uh, that's just, that's a place that I, that I know is problematic. Um, and then the other thing that we've looked at that we're actually maybe gonna be talking about a little bit later in our meeting is, um, just that, you know, there are within neighborhoods pretty established um, bike and ped networks, you know, some better than others. Mm -hmm. But the parts that always seem daunting are these, and where you, you know, when you look at the collision data, it's also super apparent, are just these major arterials, including, I guess, and especially Willow Road. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're a middle school student living in Bellhaven right now, you have to cross Willow Road to get to middle school. Um, and it's really gnarly. It's really, yeah. it's, and, and there's, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of traffic, um, way more traffic than the roads were designed to handle right now. Um, and, and just the stretch of Willow Road that Caltrans controls is a horribly inhospitable place for yeah. people who are not in a motor vehicle. Um, I rode it just last weekend. Um, and, you know, there's a really narrow bike lane, cars going 45 or 50 miles an hour, you know, glass, like, yeah. bad pavement, et cetera. So if you're thinking about low hanging fruit and places to invest, I would look at these really high traffic, high speed inter like roads and intersections that people have to get across and through and along to get to where they need to go. Um, El Camino is another I, one, middle field, obviously. Um, I would imagine you're, you're, you're right, you're spot on. I mean, the Richmond plan we just finished, so much of it was about intersection safety, for example, along Richmond Parkway or, you know, out in Pittsburgh Bay Point, you know, having to cross the four on these horrible, you know, auto focused intersections if you're on a bike. So I think you're spot on that, that we'll hear about that and we'll focus on that. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And um, what I see, it is almost eight and um, Commissioner Sebrian said that she would um, be out for about a half an hour, which means that she will be coming back momentarily. So I am wondering whether the um, uh, staff and consultants would have the uh, patience to um, 
uh, uh, sit through our uh, at least the the uh, staff presentation on actually so if she actually missed the presentation then I guess it wouldn't make I'm wondering what makes sense to re review with her versus just um uh you know s sending her to you directly because she does live in Belhaven and she will have additional ideas so maybe it's not it's it's uh uh it doesn't make sense to uh, wait for her unless I'm going to improvise here. Um, has um, does it make sense to like have a typed up list of all of the outreach places that we have mentioned in this conversation, and then in a few minutes when Commissioner Sebrian comes back to have her eyeball the list and make any additional recommendations? Um, the chair, if I if I may jump yeah. in, um, in the interest of time and also you know in the late hours, uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure Greg and Susie would be happy to stay. Uh, but in, in the interest of time, perhaps what I can recommend is to uh, just let them let them um, mm -hmm. rest for the night, and then I can t uh, get uh, Commissioner Sibrian to be in touch with them offline, and, and that way they can communicate and exchange uh, some additional notes if necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. And Go Commissioner, I'll, I'll remind you also that on that last slide is my email address. Anyone is, can feel free to, to write me directly. There's also the URL to CCAG's website for the project, which has the uh, community needs assessments on the site, as well as links to the surveys. So please keep in touch with, with myself or Susie if you want. Um, mm -hmm. okay. Um, well, uh, uh, thank you very much to Greg and Susie and the community-based transportation plan team. Okay, thank you for having us. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Uh, good night. Okay, so we, um, we're going to move on to the next item on the agenda, which is to receive an update and provide feedback to the Ravenswood Avenue bike lane gap closure project as part of the Ravenwood Avenue resurfacing project. And uh, Kevin Chen, the senior transportation engineer will introduce this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, if you allow me a few seconds to pull up the slides and also share with the group. There we go, great. And can I just get a confirmation that you can, you guys can see my slides okay? Yeah, awesome, great, thank you very much. Well, uh, thanks again, Kevin Chan, uh, Senior Transportation Engineer with the um, Cedar Menlo Park. So um, happy to present this project uh, to you tonight. Uh, I think this is a long time coming. Uh, so many of you already know the background. So I try to try to go through it as uh, soon as I can and then open the uh, open the floor for, for any clarifying questions. Uh, so as many of you know, oops, sorry. Uh, for the agenda tonight, uh, basically I'm gonna quickly go over the background for the project. Uh, obviously, anything that involves um, transportation, bike lanes, um, lane reduction, etc., we would like to conduct a, a transportation study if possible. And, and in this case, we were able to uh, secure the funding and then also conduct a transportation analysis, which obviously enhance the outcome and, and uh, the, the recommendation that we have tonight. So I'll go over the study. Uh, the study results obviously will be talked about. Uh, finally, a, a, a staff recommendation as well as uh, the next steps necessary um, for, for, the, for this project to come to completion. So just briefly go over the, the background. Uh, so there's actually two projects uh, in, in the making that, that, that really stem from, from what the project that we are presenting to you tonight. Uh, the first that I want to bring to your attention is the Ravenswood Avenue resurfacing project. Uh, many of you know this is uh, the city has a, a resurfacing program, uh, and this is one of the projects that have been uh, budgeted and, and allocated resources for fiscal year 2020 and 2021 um, to, to be completed. And the scope of that project is 
from Elma Street to Markerson Drive. Uh, so that stretch of Ravenswood is anticipated to have a uh, resurface then for that for that stretch of Ravenswood. Uh, uh, of course, the, the city has always strived to be able to uh, combine projects when, when possible. And, and of course, with resurfacing jobs, uh, the, the first and foremost questions that we have is, are there any striping or improvements that can be done uh, either through feedback from residents or, or other citywide documents that have iso isolated and identified projects for that particular stretch of the roadway. And in this case, we do, uh, as, as a matter of fact. In our recently adopted transportation master plan, uh, in addition to the uh, railroad crossing se separation project, uh, there was a desire to complete a bike lane project on Ravenswood. And this is uh, project number 78 of our transportation master plan. And the project scope is to install bike lanes on Ravenswood between El Camino Real and Noel Drive. So if we combine those two projects together, uh, that means there's an opportunity for us really to uh, take advantage of the resurfacing project and look at the striping within the, the combining scope to see what can we do to improve that area. Uh, so the outcome of that really is tonight's project, the bike lane gap closure, uh, where we're looking at Ravenswood Avenue from Elma Street to Noel Street, which is um, the overlapping segment between those two projects. Uh, just briefly uh, go over the existing conditions along Ravenswood. Uh, many of you know this stretch well, so I won't go into some of the details. Uh, generally speaking, uh, this stretch of Ravenswood is signed 25 miles per hour. Uh, there's a, a, a very obvious bike lane gap, at least for the eastbound direction, uh, as you can see on the figure. Uh, the westbound direction, there is an existing bike lane uh, from Middlefield, which is kind of the far right of the image outside of the picture, and then stops at Noel Drive. And then you'll, the, the facility then turns into a bike route of a share row uh, with those share row icons all the way to El Camino and beyond when, uh, where Ravenswood turns into Menlo. So, so as you can see from a, from a bike gap standpoint, uh, eastbound, we do truly have a, guide, uh, a bike gap that, uh, that there's an opportunity for us to complete. Uh, and as a result of that, we're also looking at uh, opportunity for westbound. So in terms of the, um, what, what we are trying to evaluate as far as part of the, the transportation study, uh, really we're trying to understand what are some of the concept, conceptual options that we have in order to put in the bike lane. Uh, first and foremost, um, the, the most easiest way is to always move the curb line uh, to put in anything else you want, uh, which really comes down to concept A. Uh, uh, the, my next slide, I'll have some images, so I'm going to go ahead and describe them briefly and then uh, talk in more details in the next slide. Uh, we also have a concept B where we utilize the existing curb to curb distance uh, for that segment uh, and then looking at how we can potentially have the bike lanes in and what that would do to traffic. And uh, in typical fashion, when, when, we, when we're looking at the uh, uh, transportation study, some of the metrics that we typically would evaluate are, are level of service, queue length, uh, travel time, et cetera, to, to really gain a, a better understanding of, of congestion level. Uh, and again, with the installation of bike lanes, we are uh, looking at some potential impacts to, to vehicular congestion, so we wanted to make sure that uh, that is properly evaluated. Uh, so here are uh, two screenshots of the separate concepts. Uh, we have concept A on top and then uh, concept B on the bottom. Uh, so briefly, just to go over concept A, we are we're proposing to move the curb line down a little bit uh, and in order to have two bike lanes plus two travel lanes. Uh, the, the, obviously, with the resurfacing job, um, moving any of the curbs is uh, currently not budgeted. Uh, so if we do go with this option, um, there is a significant cost uh, and a schedule impact as well. Um, however, given that we are spending the resources to do a study, uh, we wanted to make sure that the study is comprehensive. Uh, so as a result of that, we decided to include this concept even though it's not currently budgeted or scoped 
uh, as part of the resurfacing project. Uh, concept B is a little bit um, it's a little bit different uh, in a sense that we are retaining the existing curbs. We are also able to retain the two eastbound travel lanes um, by putting in the bike lane on the eastbound. However, in order to have a westbound bike lane, uh, we would need to drop one of the westbound lanes. So as you can see, there's a, a very distinct difference between those two options. And, and of course, option A being much closer to the existing conditions than option B. So those were the, including the no project option, those were the three concepts that we decided to evaluate as part of this project to see what their impacts are. So in typical fashion, when, we, when we're looking at a tra transportation study, we wanna make sure that we capture the existing conditions as well as a future condition. Uh, so in this case, our existing condition it represent a 2019 condition, which is the pre-COVID. Um, we recognize that COVID has been uh, taking a toll on the transportation behaviors, and we recognize that we might not necessarily get the most representative count if we do that right now. So we decided to go back and look at some of the older counts that, that were dated pre-COVID uh, in order to get a, a more uh, true, true evaluation, um, recognizing that eventually we might be able to go back to normal. Um, so here is a, an image of the analysis uh, using a software called SynchroSim Traffic. Uh, I described that briefly in the staff presentation, but it's essentially a software that it's a simulation software that allow us to look at the corridor and, and the interaction between in intersections where the queuing from a particular intersection would actually impact the upstream intersection. Um, so a much more sophisticated software, um, more time consuming, more costly, but we, we felt it, it was necessary in order to, to uh, really look at this closely. Some of the other locations that we have used this software for would be uh, you know, Willow Row, uh, Bayfront Expressway, Marsh, wherever there's a, a corridor that congestions are, are really severe, that's when we'll use that software. Uh, so here is the screenshots of the existing AM and existing PM conditions. And as you can see, the analysis focus on Ravenswood between uh, El Camino Real and Laurel. So one caveat of that is, you know, we did not capture uh, the, the true condition along El Camino Real, um, for example, in the PM, or, or both AM, PM peak hour, for those of you that have driven or uh, roll your bike through that area, you know that uh, Al Camino gets fairly congested during the peak hours. Um, given the scope of this project, we recognize that you know it just it's un, um, it will be fairly burdensome from a uh, resource standpoint, but also uh, a bit unnecessary to to include the Al Camino, as the fact that we're trying to do a uh, comparison between concepts. So I, I do want to highlight using this figure. Um, what each of the concepts would do. Uh, so the blue is the no built, so existing conditions. The green is concept A, so to uh, that that would be the uh, bike lane plus two travel lanes each direction. And then the orange is concept B, which is which is the um, bike lane within the existing curves. Now, as you can see from the figures, you. Concept B does create a, a bit more queuing, uh, especially in the westbound direction. Um, as a matter of fact, for both AM and PM, uh, Concept B actually would extend the queue almost all the way to Laurel. Um, but as you can see with the queuing figures along Laurel, is that it doesn't quite get all the way to Laurel enough to create an impact. So in this case, we do see a longer queue uh, using concept B, uh, again, particularly in the westbound direction. Um, but it's long enough to get to Laurel, but not long enough to impact the operation of Laurel. So that's kind of the main takeaway for existing conditions. Uh, here is a, a similar screenshot, but using future volumes. And in this case, future represent our 2040 volume. And then for those that, that um, are uh, interested in where we get the volume from is essentially pulled from the 500 El Camino EIR as that is the adjacent property, uh, the most recently completed EIR from adjacent property. So 
we felt comfortable using um, those volumes uh, to, to, for the evaluation. Uh, a couple of assumptions that were built into this network when we analyzed this condition. One is that we assume uh, the railroad will continue to be accurate, meaning the gates will continue to come down. Uh, there will be continue to be uh, some gate, uh, gate time coming down and, and impacting the way that Ravenswood operates. Uh, the other assumption that we built in is we changed the way that Ravenswood and Laurel operates uh, per a project that was recently approved by the city council. Um, I'm not going to go into some of the details, um, but it, it does change the, the operation of that particular intersection enough where we wanted to make sure that that was captured. So again, a, a very similar picture in terms of uh, comparing each of the concepts. Obviously, the volumes are higher, so therefore you're seeing longer queues um, for every location. Uh, the one that I do want to point out is, uh, again, the westbound direction, the queue from, uh, from that lane drop and what it does to the intersection of Ravenswood and Laurel. Uh, and as you can see from the AM peak hour, you know, it does significantly increase the queue uh, from all directions. And then this, this is um, fairly, this is, um, makes sense because if you're westbound on the Ravenswood queue back all the way to Laurel, then, uh, and then it would impact all the cars that are trying to get to that location. So you do see a increasing northbound, uh, you do see an increase on the uh, westbound from Ra on Ravenswood and of course uh, southbound as well. Um, less so in the PM peak hour, but, but it does still create a, a significant uh, difference between, between the two concepts. Uh, as compared to no built. Oh, my apologies. Uh, so with that in mind, um, staff's recommendation tonight is to um, recommend the installation of the bike lane on the eastbound direction. Uh, this truly fulfills uh, the gap, um, the gap, um, the, the the essence of the project that we uh, began with, which is to complete the bike, bike lane gap along uh, Ravenswood between Elma and Noel. Uh, this would also allow us to uh, retain some of the existing configurations along the westbound, given the, the excessive queue um, that we were seeing as part of the option B calculation. And, and really at this point, um, staff felt that we wanted to fully take advantage of the curb to curb distance and uh, fully take advantage of the resurfacing project and the schedule. So we wanted to uh, recommend the, the installation of bike lane along the eastbound direction. Uh, what this will do also, we, along with this project, there are uh, two benefits from, from, from this project as well. In order, in order for us to put in the bike lane along eastbound, we would need to reduce some of the traveling width, which would allow us to uh, hopefully see a reduction in, in tra uh, travel um, speed uh, along this stretch of Ravenswood. We would also take this advantage, advantage of the resurfacing job to perhaps put in a, um, a more permanent concrete curb. Uh, if you're driven by the area, you know that right now, the, what's separating the two directions are some rubber uh, curves with some ballers. So we would like to take this opportunity uh, to, to put in a, a real concrete curb, which hopefully, um, visually speaking, would also create the kind of the narrowing effect and hopefully reduce um, speed along this stretch of the corridor. Uh, so just briefly go over the next steps necessary uh, after tonight. So tonight we're looking for the commission's feedback on staff's recommendation. We will then take those feedback and, and incorporate them into the design phase. Uh, right now we are still tentatively aiming to have the construction completed by summer of 2021, um, given that we are uh, fairly close to that timeline. I, I do want to recognize that there are obviously many elements that could potentially push that schedule back. However, we do um, still aiming to have um, this project completed by summer of 2021. Uh, so with that, I will conclude my presentation and be happy to answer any questions.
Uh, sorry, Madam Chair, I think you muted. If you okay, I see that Commissioner Kirsch has a hand. Evan, thank you for your hard work on this. I, I feel like, <clears throat> I don't know. I, I feel like the, it was a little disingenuous to show a concept A, which is not going to be considered, right? Because the, it's not budgeted. There should have been a concept C along the lines of the letter that uh, resident John Weiner sent in, uh, which would have also uh, helped solve a really big problem we have with that crossing, probably one of the most dangerous crossings in Menlo Park at AV and Ravenswood. Uh, if we reduced both lanes to one lane, we could then get bike lanes on both sides and we could have a, uh, a pedestrian refuge in the middle. What I would suggest is that we do a field, a little field visit with as many constituents as we can and let's walk across that crossing at rush hour for maybe a half hour and decide that it doesn't make sense to keep it in the condition it's in and we really need to address that crossing. And there should have been an option C. I don't know why the city wasted time with an option A. I think you just did that so that we'd have something else to look at, but that made no sense to me. And the other is, I, I don't understand the, these 20 year projections when we really have no idea what 20 years is gonna look like. And what we do is if we, if we just assume traffic is gonna continue increasing, then we plan for that and we get what we plan for. Uh, you know, we have COVID, maybe work at home is going to be a permanent thing or partially permanent. We might get the bike pad under crossing. We might get more utilization of e-bikes, et cetera. So just to assume that we're gonna have this ever increasing traffic doesn't make sense to me. So I don't know why we bothered with option A and we should include an option C that would also address the very dangerous crosswalk. Thank you. All right, um, thank you. Um, are there other commissioners with uh, questions? No, no, no questions. I just wait when we can do comments. All right. Um, let's see. I'm looking for any any more commissioner questions. I see that um, Commissioner Sebrin has returned. Welcome back. Um, and um, the the previous topic, which is about the community, um, I'm I'm garbling the the acronym, but it pertains to Bellhaven, and and you will be followed up with. Um, and I see that there's a member of the public that has a hand. So I would like to take any questions or comments from members of the public before we have discussion amongst the. Um, Actually, um, I will ask a question um, first, and then we'll go to members. Do, do, do we have a, another commissioner with a question? Yes, okay. we have uh, Commissioner Baruzzi. Okay. Um, sorry, I can't see everybody all at once. Yeah, I've been raising both my metaphorical and my physical hand here. Um, all right. Trying to cover all my bases. Um, I'm really confused, Kevin. I, I'm like, so. There were two options in the report, which are both sort of strawmen, but what you're recommending is a third option that's not either of those first two options. Like, I, I just want to be clear. So, because of the so the staff recommendation is neither A nor B. Is that right? Uh, yes, that is correct. Um, okay, and, and the, but we yes, don't have I, data. Do we not have data in the report on what that would look like? I think that's what's confusing me. I'm like, I was. I, I apologize. Um, I, I skipped that part because um, well, one is it was in the staff report, and second, you'll you'll take some time, so I didn't want to extend the. the yeah, yeah. Sorry, longer. I just got I got um, a little confused. Yeah. So so the the reason why we chose uh, option A, uh, well, we studied concept A and concept B. In terms of flexibility, I, I think those are sort of the extreme end of both because when we look at the, the when we're looking at the project. Um, we're looking at all possible options, um, you know, options that that requires curb extensions or, or curb realignment, or, or different options that that 
can fit within the existing curve to curve. However, we, we really don't have the budget or resource to study all of them. Um, so after some evaluation, we decided to go with both concept A and concept B because those provide the most flexibility um, in, in terms of we can extract half of what they, what they did if we need to, and we would know the results of that recommendation. So really what staff is recommending is essentially kind of a modified version of B, uh, which is basically putting the bike lane for eastbound uh, and then um, currently not recommending the bike lane for westbound uh, for, due to the excessive queue that, that you would create by, by dropping that, that lane on the, um, on the westbound direction. And, and to sort of answer Commissioner Kerr's question a little bit earlier about, uh, you know, concept A, um, you know, I, I certainly recognize um, sort of the, in, in his perspective, uh, the, the necessity of, of that particular concept. Um, however, given that staff, we, we wanted to make sure that we explore all options uh, and, and that while we recognize that there was no budget to, to realign the curb, really to, to fulfill concept A at this moment in time, you, you know, we do want to analyze it, make sure that we, we understand the, the, the impact to it. And then also, if for whatever reason, there's, there's a desire to, to, to go with A, that that would be a stage that we explore a little bit later on. Um, but but we, we didn't want to necessarily just stop at um, what, what the resurfacing job can do. We wanted to kind of expand that a little bit more, given, given that we have this opportunity to do the study. Okay. Uh, I think I, Commissioner Kirsch also has his hand up. Devin, I, if you claim to have covered all the available options, then you should have, it just would have made sense to look at an option C, one lane in each direction. And then you could address that very dangerous crossing. I mean, again, we're, we're all about vision zero. This to me looked like a 1960s presentation all about level of service for cars. And we have one of the most, maybe the, the most dangerous uh, pedestrian crossing in the city. And you didn't even show a plan that would help address that plan C. So you guys didn't show all the available options. And I feel like for some reason you left that out because the city is still focused on level of service for the automobile we don't want to we don't want to inconvenience the automobile and for that reason we're going to we're going to maintain this very dangerous intersection where we know somebody's going to get injured or killed eventually we just know it if you walk across that street so right. i i don't understand why the city i feel like you should go back and give us an option c and let's debate this and decide what direction the city wants to go does it want to go level of service or does it want to go vision zero complete streets? Uh, um, Commissioner uh, Kirsch, so I, you, you, you have said that uh, very clearly and the uh, commission can consider, um, you know, whether and how to incorporate uh, that idea in a recommendation to staff and the city council. Um, <laughs> Uh, the questions that I had were in the analysis. Um, I, I, it, it's just both making assumptions about uh, vehicle traffic in 2040, but also making assumptions that Menlo Park has not implemented the grade separation. And given the fact that the grade separation has been studied by the city, uh, a, a you know, significant direction have been decided by the city council and it's going to be, um, uh, you know, it, like th these projects are hard to get funded, but also 20 years is a long time. Um, uh, can you, ha did you do any study about what the effect would be if we are so fortunate as to get the grade separation funded sometime over the next 20 years? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so, so I'll answer uh, Commissioner Levin, Chair Levin's question first, and then I, I, I do want to touch base on uh, Commissioner Kirsch's point because we, we did some do some uh, analysis as well, as uh, side analysis. Uh, so really, the this project is trying to evaluate uh, the bike lane 
in terms of um, the existing conditions with the idea of rail separation, um, this project really is it's kind of a moot point. Um, and, and the reason why I say that would be because the, the railway separation require the complete rebuild of Ravenswood, this particular stretch of Ravenswood. Uh, and if, if, you, if the commission recall a, a long time ago, when we came to the commission uh, with a design, you know, the design had conceptually speaking, obviously, because at that time it was still a concept, still a concept at this, at this moment in time, it, it did incorporate uh, travel lanes and bike lanes, uh, separated bike lanes and, and sidewalk, et cetera, for this stretch of Ravenswood. So, um, and, and that's one of the reasons why even for the future conditions, we, we didn't consider grade separation because grade separation is a separate project. Um, it, it would completely rebuild this part of Ravenswood uh, to, the, to the desire of the community. Um, so there's really no reason uh, for, for this study to look at uh, grade separation. Uh, does that answer your question, Chair Levin? Um, no, so if, if grade separation were implemented and um, the and the, the, the changes as needed were, were implemented on Ravenswood, would that alleviate or worsen the vehicle issues that were forecasted in this um, projection? Uh, so that, that is a separate entire uh, forecast um, separately from, from this project. Uh, the reason being um, with the gray separation, and, and we're going with sort of the, the current, the current recommend, recommendation by the city council is to grade separate both uh, or Ravenswood, uh, Glenwood and, and et cetera. With, with that option, um, I believe Elma would still retain some of the access. Uh, you, would, you would still have the, the bike lane and the travel lanes along the entire stretch of Ravenswood. Uh, and then the, 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 the way that the, the travel behavior would also change uh, due to the great separation. And, and so some of the queuings that we're seeing in 2040, for instance, that were the result of the gate being down, that wouldn't be the case anymore in great separation. So therefore the entire project is then a, an entirely different project. And, and that will be studied separately um, by, by the EIR eventually for the project. All right. And the, um, then in terms of, um, also in terms of the long-term timeline, um, how often does resurfacing happen? Um, so we, we have a pretty extensive uh, resurfacing program that, that selects uh, each segment of the city uh, on a yearly basis. Um, it, it really comes down to, because every time you resurface um, a, a street, you know, it, it extends the life of that street by, by 10, 15 years or so, depending on, you know, how the condition, the existing condition as well. Um, so I, I would say, you know, typically when you, when you have a street that's resurfaced, uh, you probably won't see it, won't see it resurface again, probably for another 10 years or so, unless there's a particular reason why we would do so. Like for instance, maybe there's a heavy truck usage, heavy vehicle usage that really degrade the condition, then maybe we would reconsider it. Uh, but there, it, there is an existing rotation system that is being implemented. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, any other questions from... Sorry, so if I can... Or, or for the response to Commissioner Kirsch. Yeah, that yes, would be extremely yeah. welcome. Exactly. So just uh, to quick response to Commissioner Kirsch about option C. So, so the option C, uh, while we did not look at it as a option C, we, we did look at it um, from, from two different angles. Um, so like I mentioned, we were, all, we were analyzing concept B because we can extract uh, each portions. So concept B, the westbound is essentially uh, the, that one lane direction that Commissioner Curtis mentioned. And so we, we separately did do a, a quick analysis of the eastbound um, using uh, the, the concept that, that Commissioner Kirsch described, which is kind of narrowing that stretch. I'm gonna go to my image real quick. This is not a, not a good, good one to, to talk about. 
Um, uh, so again, the kind of the top half of concept B would, would essentially be um, be the concept half of concept C, and and then um, for for the other half, the eastbound half, uh, what we did was we basically assume one traveling from Elma to Noel Drive, and in order for that to happen. Um, as, as you know, there's currently two lanes coming from El Camino heading towards Laurel. So one of, the, one of those lanes, we would have to make it into an exclusive right turn onto Alma Street. So imagine you're driving um, you know, along Menlo, try to get to the library. You would cross El Camino, and now you would see a exclusive right turn lane that allow you to make a right onto Alma Street. So that would be the configuration necessary to accomplish option C that, that Commissioner Persh what describes. So we analyzed that particular scenario, um, not, not to the extent of what we're doing here, but we did look at the simulation. And what we saw was essentially kind of using the existing figure in front of you. If you can imagine um, the, the, the concept B, so the orange line along Menlo, uh, and along both sides of El Camino, uh, essentially double, almost almost triple the, the length um, of the queue. Uh, some are double, some are a little bit longer, but but it is a it is a significant um, queue that that we're looking at, and 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 the reason is because with that 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 reduction of the length. You know, a lot of cars are trying to go through. They uh, they are not making a right on Elma, so they're trying to get through Ravenswood. So what's happening is that it's creating this kind of compound queuing effect, and th and that's why even though you know visually speaking, we're only reducing a uh, lane from Noel to um, to Elma, but because of the subsequent changes that we needed to make in order to accommodate this, the queues were getting much longer um, and. And so we, we didn't felt we felt that was a um, a, a scenario that that would, would just be um, too excessive in terms of the queuing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I thank you for speaking to that question. Um, I want to. Uh, are there any other questions from members of the commission before we go to the public, um, uh, Commissioner Purcell? Let's talk about that in in discussion. Um, uh, I want to hear from a, a, a member of the public. I see that uh, uh, Judy has a hand raised. Um, can staff unmute uh, Judy? Yes, I'm attempting to right now. Kevin, are you able to do that? Uh, yeah, give me a sec. Sorry, it's for some reason, Zoom isn't giving me the option. I think I was able to do it. Oh, there you yes. go. Yes, hi, Judy. Thank you, hi. Very, thank you very much for unmuting me. And um, hello, commissioners. What an interesting uh, discussion about this bike path. Who knew things could be so complicated? Um, my name is Judy Rocchio. I live in the Willows neighborhood. I've lived here since 1993. And my comment, although this is a very complex issue, is regarding the one single tree that concept A had slated for removal. And in reading concept B and knowing that the curb, um, mo the moving of the curb was um, taken out, I assume that the tree will stay. I can imagine no need to take the tree out. So I thought I would just listen th through the whole thing and make one comment for future plans of this type in hopes that, you know, this, this particular project will not take that tree out. But for future projects, and, and just as an aside, reading through the, the report, I see that the sidewalk would go around the power poles, but would not go around the tree. I guess the tree would still be in the way. So I would hope for the future, given that every tree is sacred in my book with climate change and the tree's ability to sequester carbon, I would hope that all future projects related to the streets and to bike lanes would save the trees, build the trees into the design so that you don't have to remove a tree to, to um, build a bike lane. That just seems ridiculous. 
so that's my comment and I appreciate all your hard work and I hope we can save all the trees in the future. Thanks. All right, uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, any other comments from members of the public before we return to discussion amongst the commission? I see a hand raised from uh, Randy Avalos. Um, can staff unmute Mr. Avalos? I uh, give me one second. Here you go, Ms. Alvarez. You are now able to speak. Oops. Uh, sorry, Mr. Avalos. Oh, there you go. Okay. Thank you, uh, commissioners. Just really quick, I would like to echo uh, Judy's comments to please consider trees as part of the community in our neighborhoods. That's all. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, do we have any other comments from members of the public before we return to the commission discussion? I am not seeing any, so we'll return this back to the commission for discussion and a, any recommendations. Um, so, and uh, please use the hand feature if you can, because I can't see everybody at the same time. And um, uh, yeah, so, so um, commissioners with hands to comment. And uh, Commissioner Kirsch. Yes, I just want to remind our commission that the, I think these queuing lengths are only the peak 15 minutes of the AM and PM, right? Just maybe 30 minutes a day out of, you know, 16 hours of light, 14 hours of light. And for that, that so that we don't inconvenience cars for 30 minutes a day, we're gonna take actions that are gonna to continue to endanger pedestrians all day long. I, I don't understand that. And I, I think the city is trying hard to move away from just looking at level of service and consider multimodal access, right? Complete streets, vision zero, to not address this crosswalk to me, it's just a terrible missed opportunity. Whatever we do with this, we're gonna live with it for another 20 years. That is a very dangerous crosswalk and there should be an option C to address it. And you know, then we'll just have to suffer for those 30 minutes a day in exchange for making, encouraging pedestrian and cycling traffic, encourage more pedestrian activity. I don't understand why we can't do that. Thank you. Um, thanks. Um, any, um, Commissioner Meyer? Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I'm on a different computer now. I, now I see where I can see the raise the hand button. I was looking everywhere, but where it was. Um, listen, I, I don't like to come, I don't like to come across as like the, the crazy car person, but like I, I, I have to disagree. One, it's longer than 15 minutes. I mean, I, 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 anecdotally as it is, I, I go through there uh, well, when, when we were actually traveling through space and time there uh, a year ago. Um, and in the afternoons, it's horrible for a couple of hours. And in the morning, it's horrible for a couple of hours. And if we crank those lanes down both ways to a single lane, you're talking about back in traffic all the way up to, I, I see what these, these little lines are showing here, but they'll back things up to MA High School and back things all the way up, all the uh, all the way the other direction, coming back to the to the Fremont Park. Um, I think that there's more danger in that, uh, in people getting frustrated and doing stupid things with their cars or, around other things, uh, th than it is to have everybody circulating or trying to cross at that crosswalk. I think the real issue is is that. It's just a crappy design that we need to redo the entire area. We have to get the we have to get grade separation, uh, or we have to have start talking about some other ways that we're we're going to deal with that. Either we, either we push traffic over, push other traffic over into a, a, a tunnel that goes underground for the for the bikes. Uh, I don't know. Thankfully, I think we're we're probably coming into a climate pretty quickly that we may well get a lot of federal money for infrastructure projects. 
and possibly this will be something that's not on the 20 year timeline that we'll be able to uh, realize something better. But I really don't think trying to crank those, those two lanes down to one uh, while saying we, we want to encourage other things, we're talking about making it just a, a disastrously awful intersection to get through. Uh, and I think it's gonna cause more problems and frustration with people get, uh, pulling their 5,000 pound cars off and trying to turn around and make U-turns and get out of there and do whatever they're gonna do. And it's gonna push that all the way over to Oak Grove and where we're already trying to encourage people to have more bikes over there already. And we're just gonna put more cars over there with those bikes. So it's a hard question, but that's, uh, that's my thoughts on the matter. Um, any other thoughts from commissioners? I see uh, Commissioner Lee. So Kevin, if we could go back to the, the concept A, concept B slide, just to look at what the configurations would look like. Um, so uh, I, I mean, I, I understand, I think my concern about trying to reduce um, vehicle lanes right there is the, I'm, I am worried about the impacts to what happens right before and after on each side, right? So as a bicyclist, if I'm coming down, if I'm heading west on Ravenswood and I'm heading towards El Camino, um, once I get to the end of the proposed bike lane in either concept A or, or this, uh, or concept C, what, if, if there's a bike lane there and it suddenly ends after I get past, uh, what would that be? Is that Alma? No, that's not Alma. When I get past- uh, Yeah, Alma Street. Um, is it Alma when I get to the end there after the crosswalk? Yes. Okay. So yeah. when I come to the end there, then I'm right, I'm almost in front of the train tracks at that point, right? And then I have to deal with the cars. If I'm if, if cars are going from one lane and then merging out into three, then I have to be suddenly thinking about, okay, I've got to cross the train track safely, which is, you know, an issue if you're on a bike. You do have to think about navigating some sort of, you know, those metal tracks a little bit. It's just not the most pleasant way to cross, right? When you're cross thing to cross on a bike. So I've got to think about that. And I've got to think about dealing with the merging with the traffic, which has suddenly been released from this bottleneck. I mean, not bottle that, but from one lane, shall we say, into three lanes at that point, right? So that's a pretty scary scenario to me as a bicyclist. Um, so, you know, I, I think I, I, I totally, you know, I respect where Commissioner Kirsch is coming from. I do think that, you know, that, that pedestrian crosswalk does feel very exposed, but it has to do with that confluence of things that are happening there, right? There's the two lanes merging together. There is the train tracks right next door. I mean, it's just very problematic. So I don't think just going from one lane, I don't think, I think, I, I, I feel like that proposed solution might create some sort of like un, unknown consequences that we would, would not, you know, that would create, yeah, further complications and, and safe, safety hazards that, that seem, I don't know, it doesn't seem that easy to me, I guess. Thanks. Um, so uh, Commissioner Sebrin has a hand. Hi, uh, thanks, sorry I missed um, part of the discussion, but I'm glad I got to be here for the discussion part of it. I, um, as I've been listening to all of it, I, I um, I totally agree with Lydia. Like as I, I ride that stretch every day, and um, if I'm thinking about going westbound on Ravenswood, like currently, I just get that whole lane because it's a share lane, right? So as I and then when I cross over the tracks, that feeds me pretty directly right into Menlo or easy into the left turn lane to turn left on El Camino. If the cars, if we're, if they get a single lane there and I have my bike lane, then they are right, right now they're behind me because I'm in the lane they want to be in. But if I'm in a bike lane and they're in a single lane, then we're all going to have to figure out how somebody who wants to turn right on El Camino, somebody who wants to go straight on Menlo and somebody who wants to turn left on El Camino, like they're all going to be doing that at once. And I can see that would create right now. It doesn't feel that unsafe. And then, but I would say on the eastbound portion of Ravenswood, 
like that ride is a little sketchy on the way home because you've got to temporarily share lane and they don't really want to share lane with you because they're all trying to get in their lane so that they can turn left. But to the problematic intersection thing, um, uh, yes. Like part of it is I think acknowledging that what we're doing is a temporary fix. Like this is not the long-term solution at, at all. And so to sort of acknowledge that from Laurel Street to the railroad tracks is a thing that needs to be dealt with. Um, I, I think then at least makes this when you're looking at the bike lanes, like I can agree to a choice that makes the eastbound like temporarily a little, a little bit safer, but just acknowledging that we have bigger changes coming to this whole section because it's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I have a, a thank you. I have another question for staff, which is if staff had a crystal ball and you knew that one of our Congress people was get, able to get earmark funding and we need to do more planning and we would have grade separation implemented in eight years um, or, you know, maybe in the next time, like we would have great separation in 15 years, but before that, like long-term scenario, if we, if, if, if staff had a crystal ball and knew we'd have great separation in 10 years, what would the recommendation be? Um, <clears throat> if it's within 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's before 10 it gets, years. Uh, be, like be, before the next resurfacing. Okay, right. So it would be resurfaced already, but uh, Ravenswood uh, or the Great Separation Project would be able to move forward and, and be constructed within a 10 year period, if that's what you are, you're saying? Yeah. What would you recommend if you didn't have to look forward 40 years with an at-grade crossing or 20 years of an at-grade crossing, what would your recommendation be? Gotcha. I understood, understood. Um, I think at this moment in time, uh, probably still go with our recommendation, um, and and for, and of course, primarily we're talking about the westbound uh, or the reasons why we wouldn't recommend westbound. You know, um, because many of the like like the both Commissioner Lee and and um, Commissioner Cyprian mentioned that we, we do drop the bicyclist uh, essentially at a, a very inconvenient location. Um, to, to say the least, and and really, it, it, it would be if it wasn't for the great separation. I think it would be extremely difficult to continue that bike lane all the way to El Camino, um, I, I would, be, just because of the infrastructure, existing infrastructure around the area, um, the the sheer amount of, of uh, resources necessary to to reconfigure that area. Um, into a usable bike lane. Um, I, I, I would say I would still recommend um, our, our current recommendation, um, especially knowing that we can, uh, the, re, you know, the rail separation is coming um, and, and we will soon have a, a complete bikeway network along Ravenswood. I think um, that, that, that would be my, my recommendation. Mm -hmm. Okay, does Commissioner Sibrian have a hand um, is it a, a legacy hand left over or is that a new hand? No, it's a new hand. All right. Um, um, it's, yeah. I apologize if this was covered earlier, but one of the things I'm pondering is all of this is absent a bike undercrossing at middle. And so I am wondering like, how does the bike undercrossing at middle fit into how we're funneling bikes across town? And if we know that this intersection seems like it's going to suck into the foreseeable future, like, sorry, it will be problematic <laughs> into the foreseeable future. Like, I, are we also looking at ways to try to funnel bikes like through Burgess Park and not even get to Ravenswood? So that if you're going from middle to MA, for example, that you would not get to Ravenswood at least until Laurel Street when you have bike 
expats. So I'm just pondering if it's going to be really difficult, maybe um, it's already been covered, but how that undercrossing could change the way we kind of try to encourage bike traffic to go. And that might make this a little bit easier. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna uh, jump in on that as a user of this intersection, um, it, like it, in, in non-COVID times, it's close to daily and sometimes more than daily. And I live near downtown and would like go to the train and go to the library and go to many different locations across town. And um, for like, I, I think for a safe route to school, um, it, you know, routing people in a more convoluted route may make sense. But for someone who's actually trying to get to a place, routing somebody on a bike out of their way by a half a mile or more is not a reasonable thing to expect. And I would want as a user to make our choices, including some of our hairier choices, um, somewhat safer, even while, like I, I wouldn't wanna say, well, we have the super safe thing over there. So we're gonna assume that everybody's gonna go all the way out of the way. That's my personal experience as a user where a safe route to school is different from a people trying to get somewhere. Um, Commissioner Kirsch. Yeah, Dean, I just want to agree with you. Cyclists are no different than car drivers. We don't want to go out of our way. We want to get to where we're going. I use this intersection all the time, uh, going to Burgess Pool, sometimes by bike, sometimes by car. Uh, you know, one thing maybe the city can consider doing is just like the county has been doing uh, with the Santa Cruz Avenue up by the Y and the Alameda, they are trialing. Uh, reduction in lanes just on a trial basis, perhaps the city could consider trialing uh, one lane in both directions. I really feel like the assumption is just traffic is going to continue to grow. That may not be the case. After COVID, there may be a reduction in commutes because a lot of people will be working at home many days a week. We may get the undercrossing. There are over a thousand car trips to the Burgess facility every day. Maybe some number of those are going to be by bike or pedestrian. So I really feel like we can't just assume we're going to have this straight line increase in demand over time. I feel like things are going to change. Maybe the city could consider trialing uh, one lane with cones or whatever. The county is doing that now, and, and it's working for them out in the uh, uh, Santa Cruz Alameda corridor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Commissioner Berzi. Yeah. Okay. So a couple of thoughts. Um, it seems really hard, especially considering induced demand, the changes in our society that we've seen with COVID and sort of uncertainty about how many of those might be longer term. Um, the, introduction of e-bikes into the lexicon, which means that a lot of people are using um, modes of transportation that are like significantly faster and larger. And I mean, you know, like it's, it's. Um, I don't feel like we can say with perfect certainty. I also, we're, we're using assumptions from an EIR that was done before a lot of this stuff was happening. Like the EIR, the EIR for 500 El Camino Real is like five years old almost, or four or five years old. So like, I'm a little like, I'm not, I don't know. I don't think that the 2040 predictions, especially considering that we're probably at that point going to have a signalized intersection at Alma and a grade separation. Like, I don't think those hold a ton of water, but I don't want to see this um, get a lot wider. When I look at the accident data, the pedestrian and bike collision data at this intersection, um, most of what I saw wasn't challenges for people going on Ravenswood. Um, and that's probably because the people who aren't confident about biking on Ravenswood just don't. <laughs> like it's a place for Jackie on her e-bike and me on my road bike. And my son who's been biking forever and has no concept of fear. It's not a place for people who aren't already out on their bikes. Like somebody who doesn't feel comfortable biking outside of a bike lane is not gonna take Ravenswood. Um, and you know, the, our ultimate goal I think is to create spaces for those people too. And that's a longer term project. Um, but there are too many variables that we don't know right now. So. We're probably not going to achieve that here in the short term. 
Um, I think I would like support the staff recommendation with a very heavy heart, but I would say one thing, um, like I absolutely don't wanna support the, uh, the widening of Ravenswood in any way, shape or form. Um, and sorry, I'm all over the map because I'm really tired. Last night's council meeting went late. Um, <laughs> I, we, don't, we shouldn't widen it. Um, most, of the, most of the accidents that we see are um, kids and train users and people on bikes and ped who are crossing Ravenswood at Alma. And so, you know, I agree with Bill that like really focusing on solutions, near-term solutions to um, that challenge are gonna be important. Um, one thing we could do is, you know, work with the schools or some other agency to consider crossing guards during the peak hours of the morning, sort of in the shorter term phase so that we can sort of batch people. Um, if we are looking at quiet zones, which we are, and that's even a thing that the city might be considering changing the gate configuration at the train crossing and changing that, like we should see if there are creative ways to improve the pedestrian crossing sort of as a part of that project, um, including things like Hawk beacons that sort of line up with the crossing gates being down, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another thing that I would love to see the city consider though, um, I just, uh, Oakland did this trial that Fair and Peers organized um, a few years ago where instead of just having sharrows on a bike lane, uh, sharrows like the ones we have, they had a continuous green lane. So the concept was basically the same as sharrows, which is like bikes are sharing a lane with cars. And here is their, here's the position where they're supposed to be. Um, but it was more like a yellow brick road or something. It was like this long green strip, five feet wide that, that sat in the middle of the right-hand lane. Uh, and I wonder if, if we're repaving, resurfacing, if that wouldn't be something to consider for this stretch of Ravenswood where um, the bike lane goes away and you want to be really clear to all of the users of the streets where um, everybody should go. Like if you're on a bike, then it's like, you're not connecting the dots. You're like following a pathway up to the intersection. And if you're a driver, you see that pathway and you're like, okay, something's going on here. It's just a thought. It's kind of a, I, and I haven't dug into the study enough to understand like whether um, it's something that we would even consider, but um, I wanted to throw that out there. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think a good number of us have had a chance to ask questions and share thoughts. And I'm wondering whether anybody is ready to make any motions. Um, I see a hand from Commissioner Meyer. Yeah, I'd, I'd move to support the um, recommendation by staff. All right, are there any seconds to that motion? All right, uh, a re reluctant second from <laughs> Commissioner Baruzzi. Um, holler if I'm incorrectly interpreting the body language. Um, and then uh, Commissioner Espinosa at hand. Actually, can I can I make a friendly amendment to the motion that I just seconded? Um, can staff help us with Robert's rules of order here? Depends upon what it is. Oh well, yeah. So I would, can I mention? Yeah, yeah that's. Um, I can make it to the mo to the Mike, Yeah. Mike, can we can we encourage staff to consider the use of a continuous um, Shero from the section in, in that dicey section between wherever the bike lane stops and the westbound direction and the El Camino intersection? like to explore whether that's a viable uh, option for this segment. Um, can would, can, can staff fine. speak, to, go, so, so, sorry. Uh, um, I'd be fine allowing that to say that, uh, make that a friendly uh, uh, amendment to, 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 to my motion that you seconded it, if, if the staff will say that that's part of the realm of reality. Can staff speak to whether it makes sense to investigate that and like whether there's any evidence that that kind of thing is um, helpful. Uh, yeah, uh, certainly welcome that being a, um, a, a friendly amendment to, to the motion. Uh, I, I had the notes down there. So we'll, even, even without that amendment, we, put, we would have explored that option. Um, I, th I think 
we, we have something similar like that. Uh, I think we have a couple location, maybe one location in the Belhaven area where the right turn lane has uh, blocks of green dash areas that, that sort of represent that it's a share row, but, but highlighted um, by blocks of um, like the, like Commissioner Gruzi mentioned, like the zebra configuration. Um, so that's certainly something that we, we can look into and, and see if we can incorporate that into the design. Um, we basically do that in all of these places where we have the green intersection treatments, right? Like there's not technically a bike lane there, but there's like a pathway. And like basically what this would be saying is like, there's this sort of this no man's land happening there between the crosswalk and the, and El Camino and like be really nice to have some super, it's super expensive. Uh, I think staff has said yes. So, okay. so, 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 so with that, um, and, uh, did, did commissioner Espinosa have a hand? I did. I, I I didn't really get a chance to to comment when we were doing the comment period, so I don't know if it's okay to still do that or if we're at voting at this point. You, well, you can. Uh, yeah, in in the when there is a motion and a second, um, it is you know free to uh, discuss the uh, motion. Um, yes. Yeah, uh, feel feel free to discuss the, the topic here. Okay. Um, I uh, just, you know, before we go to vote, just want to um, express just some concerns that are kind of along the lines of what Bill was expressing um, about this whole intersection. And um, just stepping back and really taking a bird's eye view of this whole downtown Menlo Park area from the new buildings along El Camino, you know, coming up from Palo Alto to all the new development around the Cal Caltrain station and the new housing and the new offices. Um, and just this desire to try to make, uh, you know, I, I, one of the things I think that one of the reasons why they've been building all this new housing near the Caltrain station is to, is to encourage people to live near transit and to not have as many cars on the road and if we really believe in that, and if that's what we really want for our community and our downtown area, then we need to continue to make it as pedestrian friendly and bike friendly as possible. Um, and we, we know that people, people walk and bike all the time from downtown to the train station, to the library, to Burgess, to the parks, all of these kinds of things. And I agree with Commissioner Kirsch that that intersection or that, um, that, cro that crosswalk there is really dangerous, um, especially when you have a green light on El Camino and the cars are flying to get across the railroad tracks as soon as, as quickly as possible. I would love to see a way to slow those cars there too. So um, I understand there's a lot of unknowns here. Um, obviously the, the pedestrian and bike tunnel at the end of Willow Road and middle, middle would be amazing to have. And I think it would take a lot of pressure off of this intersection. Um, so I know that there's no perfect short-term answer. Um, I just, I would have, I would love to have more choices than just one choice here. So I'm just wanted to express that. Um, so, um, that being said, um, I do really like the idea of, of making, um, on the westbound, Ravenswood, as you come through that railroad, come up to the railroad tracks and you go over the railroad tracks, making that safer. Um, the, the bike lane there gets super, super narrow. And when I go across there, I just immediately want to turn on to Merrill and just get out of that whole mess, um, which works if you're going, if you're headed north, doesn't work if you're headed south. So um, anyway, that's my two cents. Mm -hmm. So were, were any, like, like, like in, in those comments, is there any, um, uh, recommendation that you would like to make to the motion or to make an alternative recommendation that would be a substitute motion? No, no, I just, I just, when I go to vote, I just wanted you guys to at least hear my position as, as to where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, th thank you for uh, describing and explaining. Um, Commissioner Lee. So I realize I'm jumping in a little bit last minute with this suggestion, but I'm wondering if if the resurfacing involves resurfacing that crosswalk as well, um, 
does it make sense to explore something that might make the crosswalk safer as in like a raised crosswalk? Um, that might be a staff question. Mm -hmm. um, so typically when it comes to resurfacing, they, they do come shy of, of just reaching the intersection. Um, however, I think that's a, a good recommendation. It, we, we can take that into consideration. There's a, a couple of things that, that kind of immediately jump, jumped out at me. One is, um, you know, Raven to it is a fire truck route. So we would have to coordinate uh, with the fire district um, and, and having a race crosswalk. Uh, traditionally speaking, it, it sort of does slow down their response time. Um, you know, it's, and, and, and typically they would be okay if it's on a, you know, a, a, a less travel road, so to speak. Um, so uh, I'll take that into consideration. We'll, we'll, we'll do some coordination to, to see if that's a, a potential option, but, but we'll, we'll note that. And, and, um, and, and I just want to assure the, uh, the commissioners that it, even though for the resurfacing part, it, it does stop uh, just shy of Alma, uh, the recommendation of, of having that green striping potentially carry that through and, and on to, to Merrill, that, that is something we can consider um, is just striping. So, so we can certainly incorporate that and, and, and go beyond the scope, even, even though technically the resurfacing job only stops at Elma. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so Commissioner uh, Chris Shanahan. Thank you, uh, Dina. So building on what Lydia just asked about, making this crossing safer, which I feel really we should be paying attention to, could the city consider, I don't know how wide these lanes are, but could they be narrowed uh, by a foot or so, and maybe we gain three feet and you can create a, uh, a pedestrian refuge in the middle of that crossing. Maybe you can grab four feet and do that by narrowing the lanes. Right. Um, so, so we'll, we'll take that into account and, and see what we can do there. Um, if I remember correctly, we did sort of preliminarily look at the existing width of being available. And that I think in order to accommodate staff's recommendation, uh, I, I believe we're looking at, you know, 10 foot travel lengths already. Um, so it, it's, it's, it, it, those lengths would be narrowed down uh, compared to the existing conditions. Um, and, and we obviously would be able to have that, that curve that's kind of ex existing out there right now. Um, we'll have to look at, look at it a little bit more closely to see how, how much more right away we have to go to the median. Um, but I will make that note and, and make sure when we come to the design, we, we make sure that we, we explore that as an option to see how high of a median we can have there. Kevin, let me just uh, add real quickly, the, the real problem there, I think everybody knows, as you're going eastbound uh, from El Camino and you cross a railroad track, everybody guns it because they know they're going to have to merge and they want to get, they want to jump in front of you. I have this happen to me all the time. And the gunning happens right as you approach that crosswalk. So it, it's, it's kind of this confluence of knowing we have to merge and we better gun it, and then we're approaching a crosswalk. So I, I, I can't be the only one that thinks this is a terribly dangerous place and something needs to be done about it. Because whatever we do now, we're gonna live with for 20 years, I'm quite sure. Thank you. Um, I, I, and and uh, like all kinds of awesome suggestions. Um, uh, Commissioner Bruzzi's a hand. Yeah, I was actually raising my hand to say exactly the same thing that Bill was saying. And I, I think like, you know, if there's a way to go even narrower than 10 feet here, especially since from an emergency response perspective, if you're keeping the extra lane in each direction, there's flux in the system. And we've got nine foot lanes in places on Santa Cruz. We have nine foot lanes in places on Oak Grove. Um, I'm looking at that like little curb thing in the middle of the road and you'd have to be really skinny to be able to sort of be protected by that like if you have 
you know, if you've had some COVID weight gain, like you're, <laughs> you're like, you're already sticking too far out into the road as you're trying to stand in the middle of the road and be protected. So, so like, yeah, even if you can get like, I, I feel like in one of the staff reports I was reading, it was saying that the lane, one of the lanes somewhere was going to be 12 feet wide. I'm still a little bit confused about like, which, what the ultimate configuration would be, but like, please, like, let's, I mean, we want to slow cars down. We want to, for this intersection in particular, um, especially um, actually westbound traffic in the morning. I think that's when a lot of crazy stuff happens with kids riding your bikes across the crosswalk. I, so I, I don't know if we can add this to the motion, but I really would like to see, I would like to see staff exploring um, additional safety enhancements to the design, including narrower lanes, a little tiny pedestrian refuge, um, and perhaps innovative striping for bikes. I don't know if that's too much to ask Mike Meyer to suffer in his original thing, but I'm going to feel weird voting for something that sounds like it doesn't really include safety protections for people. It, it sounded like staff has already said that they would be willing to look into all of those things. Yeah, but can we actually get it in the motion? So yeah, that we'll put that in the motion. In the minutes, like, if that's not too much to ask. And we add that to the motion that the staff will consider reducing the lanes to nine feet and then taking that uh, the found space and creating a pedestrian uh, uh, refuge in that crossing. Like, then it feels like, again, still like a reasonable compromise for an, for an interim amount of period that I would feel comfortable voting for. Um, yeah, will, will the maker of the motion accept writing down in the motion the things that staff has already agreed that they will explore? Uh, as long as staff is fine with that, yeah, I'm fine. I, I, I think we definitely we have we have all the notes in terms of you know looking for additional measures to slow down vehicles, um, including lane reduction, um, maybe other measures that we, we can explore. Um, I, I will have to say that the knife feet um, might be a little bit too narrow in this case, and, and for several reasons, in, um, you know, tip, again, Ravenswood is a, a fire truck route. We have uh, Samtran buses that runs along the route as well. Um, going down to nine, which uh, effectively is probably more like a eight and a half true distance, because when we, we, when we say we have a 10 foot lane, it's center to center, and then the, the stripings are about six inches wide. Um, it, it really gets narrow, and and um, you know, traditionally with the larger vehicles, mirror to mirror distance, uh, I believe it's nine and a half, you know, the larger vehicles. Uh, going down to nine without any two-way left turn lanes or, or any way of um, giving the driver a little bit more flexibility is always a concern uh, for us. Uh, and you know, in, in some locations where there's a, a two-way left turn lane, where there's a, a little bit of buffer on both ends, we're certainly happy to look at nine. Um, again, we'll look at this to, to see if we can narrow it down to, you know, however, however narrow we could. I, I do not, I wouldn't necessarily want to promise that we want to go down to nine, again, for the reasons that we stated. We, we will look at it to see if it's a feasibility, but, but in terms of just kind of a first glance, uh, just because just we had this conversation quite, quite often when it comes to how narrow can a lane go, um, uh, and we have considered that quite a bit. Uh, and I think nine might not be appropriate here, just given the, the, uh, the circumstances. So and, if we were, to, if we were to say something like in our friendly amendment, that was the friendly amendment was to say that we're supporting what staff says, doing, adding, looking at innovative bicycle marking uh, and, and some way to get us a pedestrian refuge if possible. Would yeah, if we can, if we can, nine, like eight feet, three, 36, you know, whatever. If, will that be sufficient? Uh, is, is a friendly uh, amendment, Katie? Um, that's okay with me. Yeah. I would I, just want to specifically say that we're trying to grab space for a refuge. That's, yeah, that's mm -hmm. what Mike was saying. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's, so that's okay. I'm okay with doing that and doing read it back and maybe the chair can call for a vote and we can kind of move uh, on. Yeah. I, 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 I think. Um, I, I'm, uh, hmm. does staff want to quickly recite what staff has captured? And then I think we should vote because I think we're, we're, there's a sufficient agreement here. So 
Uh, yeah, definitely. So the, the motion is to support staff's recommendation with a friendly amendment to explore um, innovative uh, striping um, and, and other measures to slow down vehicle with the, with the purpose of slowing down vehicles and, and lane reduction. Um, so so that, that's what I've captured. And, and uh, again, we'll, we'll definitely explore um, all, all those with, options. I would say with the lane reduction. Oh, with, with the lane protection lane going toward a median. A, a, a refuge for a refuge. refuge. Yeah, we yeah. need to add that refuge in there. Yep. That's the goal. Yeah. Uh, okay. So are we ready to vote? Um, can staff help us with a vote? Great. Um, so for those commissioners that would like to vote uh, yes to this, please raise your hands. Okay. I believe I see hands from everyone. So unanimous, unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Phew. Uh, okay. Well, uh, uh, thanks to all for thinking about how to take a difficult situation and make it a little bit better. Um, I want to uh, go back to the agenda and move on um, in the agenda and um, a couple comments on this agenda. I know that it is getting late, but also um, we have an opportunity to um, use one of our work plan priorities to give city councils um, recommendation on the capital improvement plan for, as transportation master plan implementation. And um, that is scheduled to come forward on the 23rd of March. Um, and we had a subcommittee that met and came up with some recommendations for that. So I would love to be able to present those um, recommendations and would um, want to check with staff about potentially um, uh, swapping, uh, like taking, taking E5 while we still have any brain cells at all and then um, moving on to E4 if the E4 is um, a limited set of things to consider. Um, cer certainly welcome that as well, but uh, E4 is really a, a housekeeping item. Uh, it's it just to reflect the, the conversation that we have last time about uh, disbanding the active ch transportation uh, subcommittee. That's the only item that I have for E4. Okay, but I think there's going to be another one coming out of um, E5. Yep. So I still want to take E5 out of E4 because if it takes like one minute, we're still going to be one minute more tired. So um, uh, uh, we'll, we will uh, take E4 and how will this um, move forward with um, slides? Because there was a memo that was sent to commissioners with the subcommittee discussion and then we made some um, slides with this exact same content that was in the memo. Uh, so I do have the, the slides here uh, available and ready to go. So mm -hmm. if, if the city, uh, if the commissioners would like to um, do your presentation, uh, just give me a second to hold it up and share that with the group. Um, cool. And um, I'm going to kick it off and we'll have uh, a fellow uh, commissioners who are in the subcommittee meeting to uh, jump in at appropriate times. Um, so this is a subcommittee that the commission had approved, which is to for the implementation of the transportation uh, master plan to make recommendations to city council um, on the implementation as they relate to important decisions that the city council will be making about the implementation um, this year. Next slide. Um, so the goals of the subcommittee, um, as uh, uh, folks will remember, is to make those recommendations on the TMP implementation and specifically focusing on safety, vision zero, reducing traffic fatalities and injuries, and on uh, climate, um, and therefore uh, reducing vehicle miles traveled by creating compelling alternatives to driving. Um, next slide. Um, and and a, a, actually, um, so, so in terms of the subcommittee, the subcommittee was um, uh, officially uh, myself and uh, Jackie Sebrian. And um, in the 
um, discussion of this, we had um, in a sub Brown Act uh, manner, Commissioner Baruzzi uh, joined us in this discussion. And um, this may influence our discussion about the subcommittee, the, the uh, membership uh, later. So that those were the three people who worked on the rec the, these recommendations. Um, so what we were making recommendations for were affecting uh, the city council process and uh, a, a few really important elements of the decisions that the city council member is making this year. And the first is priority setting where council picks the top priorities for the upcoming uh, uh, fiscal year. And um, uh, council just um, had an important um, meeting on priority setting last night. They had um, a, pre a previous study session and this was their third meeting on, on priority setting. And, um, and then next comes the capital improvement plan, which is the five-year plan um, for uh, capital construction projects. Um, uh, next slide. Um, so we looked at the material that the city had put together um, over the years, including the transportation master plan, the project listing, the prioritization that staff had, had done based on lots of feedback. Um, for safety, we looked at the uh, collision map in appendix three of the transportation master plan. Um, for the priority setting, we looked at the council priority setting staff reports, including the staff recommendations. And we, for the capital improvement plan, we looked at last year's capital improvement plan. Um, uh, next slide. Um, and this is, seems to be a duplicate slide. So um, next slide. Uh, you can, oh. yeah. Sorry, yes. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, so for the criteria for the safety and vision zero, um, what we uh, looked at was um, projects that address the collision hotspots and high injury corridors and for uh, climate and vehicle miles traveled. Um, uh, we, we ask staff, well, you know, do you have data for this or, or with what rule of thumb shall we look at projects that would reduce vehicle miles traveled and improve our climate performance? And staff said, well, uh, routes that connect frequently used destinations. And so that's how, based on our knowledge of the community, um, we looked at the projects and, um, you know, had a judgment call that this is a climate friendly project that could provide compelling alternatives to driving. Next slide. Um, so the first thing that we did was um, made some uh, recommendations for council priorities. And because the council priority meeting was before this meeting, um, what we did was we met and then um, uh, I made a public comment to council saying, um, describing the conclusions of the subcommittee and said very clearly that the full commission has not weighed in, but this is what the subcommittee has done in our uh, you know, role as the subcommittee, bearing in mind that we're gonna bring it to the commission and the full commission could like decide that they hate these recommendations and then we'll report to council that we re recommend something else. Um, so in um, the priority setting, um, staff's recommendation included several things that we as a commission had already really strongly supported. So um, the middle avenue crossing of the Caltrain tracks, which connects to schools, parks, many, many, many destinations that makes many options for safe travel uh, uh, and re uh, reducing driving. Um, we had already supported um, middle avenue complete streets improvements and um, you know, this is something that we've been uh, uh, championing uh, for a long time. Um, the other item that had been in staff's recommendation for council priorities was um, a continuation of the Transportation Management Association, which is the programs to reduce commute trips, um, providing climate and uh, traffic reduction benefits. 
And so um, we recommended that these projects, which were in the staff recommendation, um, stay there. The, the Middle Avenue improvements, which in the um, somehow in the staff report got described as traffic calming. Um, we wanted to see frame more broadly as to complete streets to include the bike lanes, to include the um, you know safe uh, uh, pedestrian, um, providing safety uh, for all uh, road users. And also since in the council priority setting discussion, there were community members and council members who had additional ideas about transportation project priorities. We really wanted to hear the impact of those on these projects, which we didn't want to see delayed and any other capital improvement plan uh, uh, projects, which um, we, didn't, we didn't want to see any new projects that were worse on these goals to uh, advance uh, ahead. Um, so those were the priority setting recommendations. Um, uh, moving on. Next slide. Okay, so, um, and I'll have a clarifying question about process for, for staff when we, when we are, are, are done about how relevant the priority recommendations still are after last night's council meeting. Um, the capital improvement plan, which is forthcoming, the city councils is expected to start to review the CIP on the 23rd, um, you know, th this is our, you know, we have an opportunity to uh, weigh in. And what we found in looking at the CIP um, from last year with these lenses of safety and climate is that there were some very good TMP projects that were in the CIP for this coming year and then for the next year too. So there were, there's expected to be a, if I understand correctly, a middle field uh, repaving. And there were, um, uh, and the CIP included a, a repaving as well as um, in, uh, pedestrian improvements at a middle field, Linfield, Santa Monica intersection. And that those projects would be for 21, 22 and 22, 23. And we thought that these were great uh, climate projects because they support trips to many common destinations. And, uh, but along this corridor, what we found in looking at the TMP is that there, this is an overall high injury corridor and there are other intersections at Ravenswood and Ringwood that are also characterized as tier one projects and are hotspots in the collision map. And uh, we wanted to uh, keep the good projects and consider adding additional intersections that are also along that same corridor um, for the best overall safety report, safety outcome. Next slide. Um, so what we also saw in the CIP as a carryover um, that was proposed for 22-23, in other words, not next year, but the year after that, um, was a set of um, bicycle and pedestrian improvements on Willow and Newbridge. And that is a completely terrible, hairy, nasty, high injury intersection, which is a major hotspot in the collision map and is enabling um, connections to schools and food stores and bus stops and churches. Um, it's uh, you know very important improvement to make. But what we also did is in looking at the um, TMP, we saw that there are other Willow Corridor intersection projects that are also very high injury uh, areas, including O'Brien and Ivy. And then there's also Hamilton, which is classified as tier two, but is next to a major uh, development area. And um, given the increased commercial and residential density in the Bayside area, we thought that it would also be meritorious to think about addressing not only Willow and Newbridge, but the other high injury intersections on that corridor as well. So I um, uh, wanna um, summarize the recommendations here in the next slide. I think that will bring us to a summary. 
Um, yeah, uh, aha. So th this is, um, we're, 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 now we're drawing some higher level conclusions from these recommendations. So uh, one policy recommendation is to consider clusters of projects because there's uh, many examples of where uh, one project has more impact when you also make the um, nearby improvements. So if you're working on the middle field corridor, don't just improve one of the intersections, improve several of the intersections um, so that the, the, the whole route is better. Um, so on Middlefield, it would be Ravenswood and Ringwood and Santa Monica, and on Willow North of 101, it would be Newbridge and Ivy and O'Brien and Hamilton. Next slide. Um, there are some other insights that we came to in uh, doing this um, review of the TMP implementation with the safety and climate lenses. And I want to um, uh, 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 Katie did a bunch of the thinking on a couple of these. So I want to, uh, uh, Katie will take us through a couple of the next insights and policy recommendations. Um, sure. Uh, so we actually skipped a slide a little while ago, um, and this was an important one. Um, it was about design standards and principles. Um, and I think that's, I, 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 it is, <laughs> um, is, is, is that forward or backward from here? It's backward. It's too back. Sorry. I'm like looking at the thing while I'm looking at it and I'm mindful of the fact like go. Yeah, this is confusing. Um, sorry. Uh, it's um, Kevin, it's slide number 10. Um, it was a, it was a really good memo <laughs> that, that Adina, while working on everything, transitioned into slides. Um, okay, so, so this one, yeah. Um, we, we, we've talked about this before, but we wanted to, we, you know, the subcommittee suggested to city council that um, in light of the CIP, conversation that they're having coming up um, that they consider. Um, so staff have like design standards by which I mean, they have like a series of set of like technical guidelines that you can look up if you want to on the website and they're like mind numbingly specific. Um, but we also find ourselves in sort of like confusing situations like um, uh, politics can sometimes drive less than ex less than ideal outcomes for things like sidewalk width, et cetera. Um, and we find that it would be, um, it would behoove the city's climate and safety goals to optimize for, you know, inviting sidewalks and safe feeling bike lanes. And if we could codify some of that in the city planning documents, such that, for example, we don't build sidewalks moving forward that are also parking strips. Just, you know, like if the city is gonna build a sidewalk, it's a sidewalk, like all the time. And we, you know, we have like, you know, specifications around minimum widths um, and around accessibility for things like bike lanes as well. Um, we wanted to recommend that city council strongly consider that as well as, um, you know, a little bit more um, specificity around things like lane widths. Um, and uh, you can read the slide. But so now if you go forward, Kevin, um, to, uh, I wanted to say slide um, 12. Yeah. So, um, this seems super obvious to us, but I want to highlight it for council um, that the Vision Zero and BMT reduction goals are actually super symbiotic. And you see that when you're looking at the at the heat map, where it's like basically the arterials are where all the accidents happen. Like if you if you want to see like the vast majority of accidents in the city happen along like five streets. It's like El Camino, Willow, Bayside. You know, it's it's really predictable. Uh, Middlefield. And, uh, and those coincidentally happen to be the places that kind of keep people who are curious about biking or walking places, but a little bit more nervous. Those are the places that keep people from leaving their neighborhood on a bike to go downtown to go shopping. Um, and so if we can uh, improve the safety along those corridors by um, adding bike and pet infrastructure and uh, making it more inviting for people, then that helps both you know, our Vision Zero goal and the goal of getting people um, to consider biking walking places. And then the next slide, um, drilling down on that a little bit more, um, we talk about this a lot, but this example of Oak Grove, where we narrowed the lanes a bit, we added bike lanes and sidewalks, 
And the 85th percentile speed, which is what our city has historically used to dictate speed limit, um, dropped from like 32 miles an hour to 24 miles an hour. And I actually was so surprised by that number that I asked Nikki Nagaya if she could double check the, the math, <laughs> like make sure there wasn't like a trend, there wasn't like a, you know, like a column that got transposed or something like that. Um, and, but it's not like a, this, it really had a great traffic calming effect to add bike and pet infrastructure. Um, to Oak Grove, which is, you know, a street that also has Sam Trans buses on it, and it's a pretty major thoroughfare through our town. So, you know, if we can do that there, we can do that in other places. Um, and so we're, you know, looking forward to some of these um, cluster projects that we're talking about, um, like Middle Avenue and Willow Road and Middlefield, um, you know, considering adding complete streets features that can also slow traffic down, I think will be a really good thing. Um, Okay, so now here is the summary slide. Okay, uh, and here, here's here's the summary, and um, so 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 one is for the council priorities. Um, we wanted to support the staff recommendation, which was to have that middle uh, bike pad undercrossing of the Caltrain tracks, um, to have the middle corridor projects um, as a complete streets project. Um, that would, um, that has a typo. We wanted to frame the, the project as um, complete streets where um, it, it uh, to provide traffic calming and safety for all road users. The word complete streets should be in there and um, that was my typo. And then also, um, uh, continuing supporting the staff recommendation of the Transportation Management Association uh, pending the staff presentation um, of the research. So if the research come back and says a TMA is terrible for some reasons, we could change our mind, but um, we, we rec recommended keeping that priority. And if there's any other transportation priorities to come forward um, through the prioritization process, consider the implications of these existing priorities, plus the other good CIP projects that advance safety and climate and VMT reduction that we talked about. Um, and is there another slide after this? Um, and then our recommendations for the capital improvement plan were to support the uh, coming years of projects on the Middlefield corridor and Willow and Newbridge and consider adding other TMP projects on these, these corridors to improve safety um, on the corridors. And then for policies, as comments on the capital improvement plan, um, consider project clusters to improve safety on these corridors and to adopt goals and standards for sidewalks, bike lanes, and uh, re repaving projects to achieve more uniform outcomes um, through the city to achieve these safety and climate goals. And I think that is the end. Is there anything else in here? Nope, that was the end. And uh, 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 Jackie, is there anything else that you wanted to share in the work that you had collaborated on? Um, I, I don't have anything to add to what you um, so eloquently explained all about. I am, um, yeah. No, I, I, all of what you said. All right. Um, so would want to um, open this up, um, the uh, recommendations uh, to fellow commissioners for any um, comments, questions. Um, uh, Commissioner Lee. So quick question, is this presentation like as shown going to, is something you'll be making to city council in full or um, is it just like, how is, how, how is this going to city council? Um, so what I was thinking about doing was uh, uh, writing a letter and um, I, I hadn't even thought about delivering a presentation, I just thought about um, writing a letter that um, had the words that were in the memo, but were kind of tailored for the CIP, which is the next upcoming piece. 
So I would, I would, I mean, I think this is pretty concise and I feel like it's very easy to understand and especially with the, um, the design objectives and the key insights, those two slides um, are very like sort of high level big idea things that I think would be good to get in front of city council as slides and I feel like um, I feel like letters are, I mean, I don't know. I just feel like a presentation, if you know, you could, you could probably take what you have here and reduce it down maybe just a tad and, and give it to city council and that would get their attention a lot better than having them, you know, having to sit down and parse a letter, right? Huh, okay. Um, that would be my thought. Uh, um, uh, sure, that, that, if, if the, if it is the will of the commission um that that would be a good presentation format um that sounds like a reasonable suggestion um uh commissioner kirsch yeah i i agree with lydia i think presentations are always more impactful than letters all right um any other comments or questions about the recommendations or the format with which it should be delivered to the city council um, Commissioner Barusi. Um, you um, last night were meant to present the the commission goals um, to City Council, um, and knowing the way the council agenda gets packed, I'm wondering. We used to use those commission quarterly update type presentations to shoehorn other thoughts and feelings that we had that we wanted to get in front of council. And I don't, Kevin. I'm sure we'll have opinions about this, but it's possible that since you didn't end up getting to present last night that you could pull a couple of these slides and use them for that purpose as well. Because I actually think it can be simplified even further. I mean, a number of the council members already read the memo that we shared with them earlier and have reflected on it and given us feedback. So I actually don't think that this is gonna be, it's not gonna be that hard to get council member attention on this. Um, we don't probably don't need to have like 20 slides or more than even a handful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, so, so I, I think that that will depend on the structure of the agenda, because if there's a CIP item and we have comments on the CIP, I think it would be most impactful to target them to the CIP because the council will hear it relating to the decisions that they have before them. Um, so if there is a uh, recommendation from this commission to present well like for, like for, first of all i'm not hearing anybody i'm not hearing any disagreement um we're, we're all talking about format so it, it like can, can i have a little straw poll about our people because people are all talking about how to present it um any straw poll on are these reasonable recommendations that we as a group would support hands in a straw poll. Okay, I'm not seeing any dissent. Am I missing anything? No, okay. Um, so if we're talking about how um, would the commission um, delegate to the chair and the subcommittee the ability to look at the agenda and to consider in how many pieces to make this presentation as split amongst the chair report on the work plan and the CIP item itself. Did that make any sense? Are people just sufficiently exhausted? Um, uh, I'm going to phrase this as a motion. <laughs> um, uh, Commissioner Lee, is, is your hand raised on purpose? Commissioner Lee, are you muted? Um, I was going to say that that sounds to, like a totally reasonable uh, a, pro approach to have to look at the, you know, at, look at how strategically you can deliver this in a way that is the least onerous to, to city council. Um, okay, so the motion is um, for the um, commission to 
approve these recommendations for council priorities and the CIP and associated policies and for the subcommittee, uh, including the chair to work together for um, uh, how best to present to the city council um, on the um, commission work plan and CIP commentary items. I would second that. All right, um, can staff help us with the vote? Or are there any comments or discussion of that? <laughs> Does anybody wanna discuss anything else at this hour? <laughs> okay, um, are there any members of the public that have any comments on this? I am not seeing any hands. Um, okay. I'm just amazed you can make a motion that long without forgetting what you were <laughs> saying at the beginning of it, because I totally did. <laughs> All right. Can you can, 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 take can, a poll of how many people in the audience are still awake? <laughs> <laughs> can staff help us with a vote, please? Enough out of you, as you wake. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so for those commissioners that would like to vote yes, uh, can you please raise your hand so I can see them? Okay, I'm seeing all the hands raised, so that's a unanimous vote. Thank you. All right, phew. Um, we have recommendations on um, priorities, capital improvement plan, and policies. This is very exciting. Um, okay, so now we will move on to the housekeeping item about the commission subcommittees to support city council priorities. Um, where uh, can uh, Kevin Chen, uh, Senior Transportation Engineer, introduce this item? E4. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just pulling up the, um, the item real quick. So, so really, I'm just, uh, like I mentioned, a, a bit about house cleaning items. I'm looking for a, a vote here, a motion in a second, and then a vote to uh, first, uh, disband the uh, active active transportation network subcommittee, and then and then second to add Commissioner Beruzzi uh, to the transportation master plan implementation subcommittee. Um, so, um, if I can have a, a motion and, and a second, uh, unless there's any objections or discussions. I'm, see, I'm seeing none, so if I can have a motion. Uh, I think there's a motion by Commissioner Kirsch. A second. And then a second by Commissioner Espinoza. So if I can have, uh, uh, for those commissioners that would like to vote yes, please raise your hands. Okay, so I'm seeing all the hands, so unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Okay, and we didn't actually ask for any public comment. I am not seeing any hands for public comment on that. Thank you very much for reminding me. Um, yes, so if we can maybe give the attendees a couple minutes just to see if they want to speak to the item. Um, seeing none, so I think we can we can move on. All right. So um, uh, informational items which provide updates on matters of importance to the commission which are not action items but commission staff members or members of the public may request to make a comment or ask a question on any informational items are there any informational items from staff uh no project updates for the group at this time i do want to bring to um, your attention that staff uh, does intend to go back to the city council with an update on the climate action plan uh, so that's set for march 23rd uh, and, and so for those that are interested in that one, uh, definitely stay tuned. And uh, as, as before, I will make sure to uh, share the date and the uh, staff report with the commission when it's available. Thank you. Okay, and I, I think um, folks who've been participating in this discussion will be well aware that what we have talked about in terms of focusing TMP implementation um, including with climate and VMT reduction as a theme relates to the climate action plan. And um, because those are things that this commission has already voted on, we don't need any more agreement to do stuff to execute on that. And there may be 
things in writing about um uh like we don't need any more permission to to, to comment on things we've already agreed on um uh, okay now we are on committee and subcommittee reports where subcommittees should have an extra e um in addition to typo fixes are there any reports from advisory members uh, uh on subcommittees i can't talk anymore so i think we should be done soon um uh g1 has disbanded so we don't have any comments from it um climate action plan subcommittee i actually have an idea based on what um uh, kevin just said um so commissioner meyer um would you be willing to um correspond an email about organizing our comments relating to the climate action plan based on things that this commission has already agreed to um i'm not following anything you just said but what 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 do you need me to do i'm sorry <laughs> there, there's like there's a climate action plan um report to the city council and i'm proposing that as a subcommittee we uh coordinate any comments that the commission may want to make about the climate action plan um, staff report based on things we've already agreed to as a commission. Uh, and so, I'm sorry, you want me to write something? Uh, well, why am I writing something? There's an agenda, council agenda item coming up. It's on the climate action plan. Uh, you with me are listed on a subcommittee. So what I'm, I was on planning sub I'm on the subcommittee for climate action plan. Am I reading this right? It says Levin Meyer. I, I don't I don't re recall being on that subcommittee. So um, it, it, maybe it could have been a mistake if the commissioner Meyer doesn't want to be um, or, or if it was added by mistake, perhaps we can retroactively remove him from the subcommittee. Yeah, I'm just not familiar with being on him. I'm happy to I'm happy to maybe chat with you in the background about it if I can be helpful, but like my next meeting is my last meeting. Yeah, but it's before then. So yeah. and it, so it's about they, they have things on EVs and you know more about EVs than me. Sure. Why don't we talk about it offline and I'd be happy to 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 chat about that and do something. Sorry, I just for some reason I'm I'm blanking. This is like hour 12 of Zoom meetings today. Okay. Um Great, uh, thank you very much. Um, G3, update from Downtown Access and Parking Subcommittee. Any updates? Nope. G4, Multimodal Metrics Subcommittee, Barusi and Espinosa. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and me, and there may have been a meeting that I wasn't able to make. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we did meet. Um, we did meet and we talked, um, about a, a company um, called Streetlight Data. Um, and they do work at, with some of the other uh, cities up and down the peninsula. And I have received an introduction to someone from there. So I'll be learning more about that and we can bring that to a future meeting. That's exciting. Fantastic. Um, uh, if staff can just jump in real quick uh, to Commissioner Espinoza's point, uh, the city, we actually do have a subscription uh, to Streetlight Data. Uh, this is um, in, in coordination with CCAG. Uh, so happy to communicate offline uh, about anything that you that you want to know about the software. Um, we, so we have we have a, a license to, to access that data. Great. Thank you. Uh, G5 multimodal subcommittee uh did not meet um my one sentence update is that the word earmarks is getting thrown around with regard to infrastructure spending um so that is a thing that may be happening and may affect things like the ability to get grade separations funded possibly theoretically um g6 update from safe routes to school program subcommittee baruzi Cibrian lee any updates um, really quick there, the next Safe Routes to School Task Force meeting that is led by the city's um, Safe Routes to School coordinator, Andreanne, is coming up on March 17th. So I'm going to suggest to the subcommittee that we should maybe 
um, either meet directly before or after to talk about safe route to just have a subcommittee catch up meeting. Um, also, I, it's my understanding that MA is coming back in some form in April. So uh, there will be more students on the road. Yay, students. Um, uh, your chair being punchy, are there any, the Transportation Master Plan Implementation Subcommittee has taken up plenty of time and has nothing else to report. Um, G8, the Zero Emission Subcommittee, um, does Commissioner Meyer have anything to report? No report. No emissions from Commissioner Meyer. Zero. <laughs> Zero emissions. Okay, moving on. Um, do we have any public comments on any of the subcommittee meetings? Uh, no, not seeing any public comments from members of the public. So we will move on to adjournment um, to the next meeting on the second Wednesday of the next month. Good job, Adina. Nice work, everybody. All right. Thank you for sticking in with a very weighty agenda. Bye -bye. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Patrick. Good night. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, attendees.